This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at the BatmanUniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. Greetings, Gothamites. Lane here. Welcome to episode 21 of Batman Books, The Dark Knight in Prose, where the only pictures are those formed in the imagination. Except for this episode, where there will be pictures. This is part one of a special two-part project where we send off Andrew Vax's book in style. I am joined by several other podcasters as we go through the comic book adaptation of Vax's novel. It is also a crossover episode with my other podcasts related to Batman, Gothamites Anonymous. So you'll see a little bit of that format here where we treat it like a like an AA meeting, Gothamites Anonymous. So I hope you enjoy. As always, you can contact me at darknightpros at gmail.com, on Twitter at batmanbooks underscore DKP, and also on Facebook. Hi, I'm Lane, and I don't know enough about Batman. Hi, Hi Lane. Lane. Hi, I'm Kat, and I don't know enough about Batman. Hi, Kat. Hi, Kat. Hi, Kat. I'm Chris, and I'm addicted to Batman. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hey, Chris. I'm Maggie, and I know a f- amount about Batman. Hi, Hi Maggie. Maggie. Hey, I'm John. I know tons about Batman. But I was having some problems sleeping, and my uh, doctor told me that if I really wanted to um, cry, I should go to a, a support group. And nothing sadder than Batman uh, support groups, am I right? <laughs> That's a good, Hi, fair point. Hey. Hi, John. Now, John, you can't get the first step if you don't admit that you have a problem. This is true. This is what we call skirting the issue and drinking free coffee. <laughs> All right. So today, obviously, is a special episode. Kat and I have, uh, what, tripled our number of podcasters we normally have on this I don't math, so that could be. But anyway, um, this is a a crossover episode. We're doing a one-off of... This is a comic book adaptation of a novel that I read on Batman Books, The Dark Knight in Prose. And this is Batman the Ultimate Evil, an adaptation of the novel by Andrew Vax. And some of the creators, we have Neil Barrett Jr., Dennis Cowan, and Prentice Rollins. Rollins? Apparently none of us have heard of before. I looked them up today. Oh, did you? Yes. Uh, Neil Barrett Jr., the reason I haven't heard of him is because this is like one of two comics he's ever done. He's This and a Predator book for a dark horse, which what's hilarious about that is the that was a part one of two, and the person that wrote part two was Andrew Vax. Oh. In his comic debut, so I don't know if that happened in conjunction with this somehow. Huh. And uh, Dennis Cohen... Uh, did like the question in the 90s and I never read the question in the 90s so huh. I still don't know anything about it. I think that's exactly how the question would like it though. <laughs> just to add on that just to add on that, uh, Cowan just recently did the uh, DC Black Label, the question The Death Civic Stage which just came out by DC Ooh. Black Label not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago so he seems to be like the definitive uh, modern question artist Okay, okay I can support that. My so, name's John, I don't know enough about the question. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. This one's about Batman. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wrong support group. They're in the next room. They're in the next room over. <laughs> it takes place right after this one. Y'all can meet up after. It's fine. Good. Fair enough. As long as I get the coffee. <laughs> okay. So, opening up, we have kind of a, just a, a city scene. You can see some skyscrapers in the background, and in the foreground is a wooden bench. A street lamp and a homeless person sleeping upon said bench with newspapers under him. And the narrative says, 
if Paris is the city of light, what then is Gotham? Which is still one of my favorite lines to open up a Batman novel ever. From its downtown government center, where buildings crowd each other like subway passengers, to its midtown glitz of luxury hotels and four-star restaurants casually dispersed among ultra-ultra shops, to the uptown splendor of its high-rise co-ops and condos, Gotham stands as an international symbol of cosmopolitan success. And uh, I'm thinking this is word for word what it is in the novel. Airline pilots love to bank low over the city before landing at Gotham Airport, treating the passengers avidly lining the windows to the magnificent skyline. Viewed from above, Gotham by night resembles nothing so much as a ribbon of diamonds artfully arranged on a pad of deep, rich black velvet. But closer to ground zero, the view changes. The black velvet has an illumination all its own. The cold, garish neon of the sex industry, the feverish light in the eyes of desperate drug addicts, the inadequate streetlights creating pools of shadows in which muggers patiently wait. Deeper down in the crosstown depths of the city, the only light is artificial and man-made as evil itself, and the only language spoken here is the unspeakable. Wait, what does that mean? (laughs) (laughs) Is it a bad sign when my first thought is, uh uh-oh? All right, get your help. On the next page, we have quite a few panels. One very long one. Um, in the long one, you see kind of the city from a bird's eye view. Or a bat's eye view. Uh, I mean, true. But, you know. Well, let me let me have my moment. <laughs> and the narration says, There's sound that is no sound. A whisper stream that flows through Gotham's heights and depths. And only those who listen to the night can truly hear the nearly silent hum of the city lore, of legend, mystery, and myth. And then we cut to see an old man. I believe he's the guy that was sleeping on the bench just a minute ago. Yeah, he looks pretty pretty battered up, pretty tired. And we cut to a close-up of his face. In this one, we get a nice detail. He has bright blue eyes. He looks a little concerned, though. And off-panel... Looking for a match, old man? And then we cut to one of the bigger panels of the page, and we see him on his bench with all of his newspapers scattered, and we see three guys around him, kind of giving him a hard time. And the old man says, I know who you are. Go go away. Leave me alone. And one of the guys standing around him says, Hey, what's the problem? Isn't nobody doing nothing to you, Pops? All we're going to do is give you a... And we cut to the next panel, and we see a whoosh of fire and the side of this guy's face, and he says, light. On the next page, in this three-panel page, the three mogers close in on the opening panel. They are very intimidating, and the flame grows closer. One of them says, Douse him, Raj. The second one says, Do it, man. The homeless person says, Stop it. I'm not a bum. I'm a person. I got a name. The next one says in the next panel, Your name's going to be Toasty Pops. Then a voice from behind says, No. And in the last panel we see Batman proclaiming, It's all over. I do like that we not only have the glowing eyes, we also have glowing teeth in that panel. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a tad odd to me. That That's a pretty 90s horrific. You would see that a lot of the time. I remember the... I was there, Gandalf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the less said about the thing I'm going to mention, the better. But the Batman Spawn crossover, uh, the one that was done by Image Comics and drawn by Todd McFarlane. McFarlane apparently doesn't like to draw Batman's face, and that's how he looked in the whole thing. Oh, wow. That would drive me bonkers. Well, a lot of things about that drive me bonkers. Written by Frank Miller and drawn by Todd McFarlane are the first two things. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of got to wonder why the three muggers in that one panel are in black and white. They're all, everything else is in color, but these three guys are in black and white. This was in 1995, so I'm going to go with coloring and er- error. Yeah, or stylistic choice since they're standing under, like directly under the street light, but then you'd think the the homeless man would be like that too so i don't know it might also be the lighting from the the whoosh of fire yeah so on the next page one of the muggers turns the fire to batman and says oh yeah try this and it looks like they douse him with lighter fluid and succeed in setting batman on fire with a thwomp 
Didn't think fire made a thwomp sound, but okay. <laughs> On the bottom panel, it says, Cape, did it, don't burn? L- let's see you laugh this off, man. I can tell he's scared because he's stuttering. And then Batman <laughs> kind of just punches them. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I, that's what Batman does to Margaret's, but yeah, we've got a thud that is and how a rack. Batman do. That, that is right. that's how he rolls. All right. On the next page, which is split up into, let's see, there's two panels towards the top, one in the, one in the middle that goes kind of horizontally, and then two smaller ones on the bottom. In the first one, Batman's talking to the homeless person, apparently, even though while walking away and saying, you'll be all right, sir, the police are on your way. You're sorry you're homeless. <laughs> Let me go back to my mansion. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. Despite the pleas of the homeless man saying that he wants to thank you, Batman switches to internal monologue, saying it's always the same. Between criminals and those who fight them, only the criminals find a perpetually re- renewable source of troops. In the next one, Batman's crooving along in, uh, oh, one of my favorite Batmobiles. Yeah. Though so it's the one where he's got his, um, his face painted on the um, on the, on the, <laughs> yep. the hood of the car, yep. which in my which is great. It's like, all right, that's what I want it to look like. It's an interesting scripting on the. Uh... Yeah, Kat and I have read some things that are a little hard to read. It'll be yeah, like, black on dark blue. Shaman was the worst. Oh, shaman. And it says, as crime fighters age, their eyes go to crap, and they have hard <laughs> reading. Com- no. no. <laughs> They face wave after wave of fresh combatants, like swimming toward the horizon. If you stop swimming, you drown, just like a shark or a bat. And yet, <laughs> what we do is not enough. So the next page, Batman is skulking off toward a hole in the Batcave, presumably going to Wayne Manor. Maybe it will never be enough. And off panel, we hear our favorite character. Are you all right, Master Bruce? So we now see their steampunk cosplay they have going in the background. (laughs) And Batman is there with his cowl off, and Alfred is there in his butler regalia, serving him some uh, tea, it looks like. I'm okay, old friend. I guess I got lost in my thoughts. Yes, sir. Whatever you say. And Alfred's giving him the uh, stink eye when he says that. Yeah. That's his way of going, bullshit, bullshit. So then in the middle panel, we see a hand holding an invitation to a private showing of Now and Today, The Greatness of Gotham, Gotham City Museum. So there's like some nice cars pulling up. There's some searchlights, a lot of razzle-dazzle. And uh, in the bottom panel, we see Bruce Wayne coming up, invitation in hand, and a doorman uh, is waving him off. No need to show that, indicating his invitation. Everybody knows who you are, Mr. Wayne. Bruce says, thank you, uh, Otto. And a woman in the background who kind of looks a bit like a Lucille Ball, about 12 sheets to the wind and a good 30 pounds heavier, and saying, Bruce, oh Bruce, you just wait right there, darling. On the next page, it seems that this lovely uh, lady has caught up to Bruce. And we see she, she has red hair all tied up. She has her gold jewelry on display. And she says, isn't it just the best exhibit ever? Don't you just love it? And Bruce looks at her. It's very nice, Diana. And she responds, don't be so modest, Bruce. Everybody knows you did your share. It's so important to make a difference. I simply... And in the next panel, she gets cut off by another woman. She has white hair, very pale complexion, red lipstick, very red. And she says, you call this PR stunt making a difference? You've got to be kidding, lady. All this shows is your Gotham City, not the way people actually live. But I've got news for you, Duchess. Even the idle rich aren't immune to crime. You can't make that go away with a bunch of phony posters. You millennials and your call-out culture. (laughs) (laughs) And in the next panel, we have them face-to-face and we see Bruce behind them. And Diana says, Really? Everyone knows crime comes from poverty, my dear. Improving Gotham's image attracts investors, and investors means jobs for... And she gets cut off. You're dead wrong. Poverty doesn't cause crime. People cause crime. Poverty doesn't cause rape, and it doesn't cause murder either. 
And then a fourth person shows up and says, stop, you're both right. You're just talking about crime from different ways. You're talking about it in a macro sense, and you're talking about it in a micro sense. But if we all get together, we can come up with some great ideas. <laughs> calm down. Just calm down. <laughs> Chris oh. is meeting me everything you hoped it would be and more so far. Indeed. <laughs> At the time of recording this, we're also in the... Mi- Almost at the end of Monster Men, and I can just see Hugo coming in and just being like, shoo shoo. <laughs> <laughs> just like the, the panel panning down like two feet. <laughs> and, and speaking of two feet, we, we got to play like which severed limb goes with what body. Oh, the that most was recent fun. issue. The, the most recent, like after rebirth? It's like chronologically, it was. Um, Oh, Year one called? shaman and then uh, monster Batman Man. and the Monster Men. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. I abandoned that series a, shortly after Batman and the Monster Men, and I think I, I can't remember why. It wasn't because I didn't like it. I'm sorry. Who, continue on with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Uh, and then we see Diana walking away with her her nose held high. Oh, go find a soapbox. Shall we move on, everybody? There's so much to see. And the the lady with the white hair kind of stands back with Bruce. And we have narration going. An exotic-looking woman. I've seen albinos before, but I never noticed what a special look it could be. Like fire inside ice. That's new. (laughs) Did I say that out loud? Yeah, that's... Well, no, (laughs) at least it's an inside thought. But still, that's a weird thing to think. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I thought in the novel that, I, I don't know, are we going to have time to talk about this later? Or should oh, sure. We just in- oh, yeah. inject this now, or how does... Or you can do that. You can do it now. Usually Kat and I go off on tangents, so... Oh, I yeah. I'll you guys do oh, Batman boy. year one, but then, so I haven't, I haven't caught up in a while. I thought it was a strange choice in the novel to make her into an albino. It's really odd to see her drawn as an albino and colored as an albino. It, on a comic book page. I don't know how this is going to work. She looks like a vampire. I thought she was yeah. like a kabuki kind of makeup, you know, from Japanese theater. Nope, albino. <laughs> yeah, no. Nope. I can't look at how they've written cause and not think it's Khalees. Every time I look at it, I think it's C-L- oh. C-L-I-S-E. Oh, yeah. What do you think of the Khalees? I had to pause the for a minute there. Crime, it's a U. I will say that of the three or four graphic novels we've read so far, Bruce looks the most um, high society in this one. Oh, yeah, definitely. He looks like he shits golden turds <laughs> in that <laughs> top left panel. I will never forget how old Bruce looked in year one. And I was just sitting there like, excuse me, what? Yeah, he's supposed to be 25 and he looked like he was 55. I'm like, no, nah, you, you don't need to draw. Like, the wrinkles will come later. We'll, we'll all get those. <laughs> fine. Don't Don't draw them in right now. It doesn't look right. Also, it might be because I just started watching The Witcher on Netflix the other day, but, like, that internal thought really just makes me think of something that, like, Geralt of Rivia would think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That tracks. Uh, I don't actually know anything about Witcher. Don't don't hate me. I watched my boyfriend play through Witcher 3. That's it. It's closer than I am, so... Okay, but the show's great. Anyway, uh, so we, we we go to the next panel, and we get a close-up of the two, Bruce and this lovely lady, and she says, what about you? Do you believe poverty is the cause of crime? And Bruce says, I believe it's a contributing factor, but certainly not the sole cause. You said people. The real question is, which people, isn't it? He's kind of looking at her like, did you have garlic recently? He's kind of like leaning away yeah, as she's leaning he's... in. On the next page, we have three rows of two panels each. The conversation continues. She says, yes, that is the question. The answer is children. The maltreatment of children is the greatest single contributor to later criminal behavior. Bruce ponders. He says, you mean like child abuse, that sort of thing? Yes, Mr. Wayne. I mean exactly that sort of thing. In fact, that's what I do. The next panel. Bruce asks, I don't understand. You apparently know my name, but... She interjects. My name is Deborah. Deborah Kane. I'm a caseworker with the Gotham Child Protective Services. Bruce, still holding his drink, says, I'd like to learn more. 
we move to the next panel, about children and crime, that is. Can you call me sometime? And in this panel, she's looking at him kind of quizzical, just unsure. Her lips are a little bit parted, and she seems like she's studying him. But in the next panel, we see that she's given him her business card. And she turns her back to him, and she says, If you mean that, Mr. Wayne, yes, call me. In our final two panels, we have a scene shift. Gotham City, hospital, 2.47 a.m. Two nurses are walking out under a streetlight as they leave the hospital. In the background, we see their jaws drop. In the foreground, we see a long machete. A man wielding it says, Drop your pocketbooks, now! And the altercation continues on to the next page. The woman throws her purse at the... One of them throws her purse at the at the guy with the machete, which is quite the weapon to bring to a mugging. <laughs> take, and the other nurse says, Take them and go away. We don't want any trouble. And then the other woman... Woo, okay. I'm looking at this now. She's actually kind of hardcore. Spread out. He can't take us both at... Ugh. So she's trying to like kick the bad guy, who says, Tough broads, huh? And then... Yeah, oh, she tries, though. Um, and then he approaches her with the machete in his hand. Now it's going to cost you more than money, nurses. And she says, no, don't. And he's definitely about to chop into her, I guess, with his massive knife. But then Batman comes and one punches him and makes his face melt, apparently, <laughs> with the force of his fist. Yeah, Batman's pretty awesome by, by this point. This is 1995. Still, though, we've got this very strange <laughs> grimace with the teeth and the mouth. He, he seems good. to, by my count, have about ten visible teeth. So <laughs> considering that you only show about a fourth of your visible teeth at any point gritting, that must mean Batman's got about forty teeth. And I think the idea is that he's supposed to be jumping, but it kind of looks as if he's kneeling on the ground and punching the guy. Oh, he's not? <laughs> no, no, because you guys, he's standing up here. But the, the perspective on this oh, yeah. panel is kind of odd. It looks like Batman's kneeling down and then punching him, but that's well, not the case. Well, I want to see hmm. what happens next. <laughs> oh. On the next page, uh, Batman's apparently gone by the next page, uh, doing his Commissioner Gordon disappear trick. And the nurses talk more. Did I just see what I think I saw? And the other one says, I don't know if you did or not. I know that this guy has a couple of compound fractures for his trouble. Moving ahead next, some time has passed, and the paramedics are the paramedics and police are here, taking their statements. And one asks, "You're you're real sure it was the Batman, right? Nailed the perp that hard, snapped his arms like twigs, dude. Have you been working in this town long? I mean, that seems like that'd be a standard. Oh, all right, Batman Definitely got it. Batman. We got a form for this one. For the third time, yes, we both saw him. Okay, uh, I don't know. Okay, okay, you ladies saw it. It just don't sound like the Batman to me. Oh, I see." Because he broke his legs. I forgot about that aspect. Maybe he's had enough of this, too, she says. Elsewhere, and else when, uh, 9.32 a.m., three days later, in a section of Gotham where the tour buses never appear. All right, so we're in the Gotham projects. There are lar- <laughs> uh, large, tall buildings. The rows of them look all of the same. It's uh, A blue car, a, a nondescript blue sedan, goes through the area... <laughs> <laughs> and said, Ms. Kane, why do I have the idea you're surprised I called? And Ms. Kane says back to him, why are you waiting until we're all the way here to ask me that question? <laughs> <laughs> We've had this entire car ride. They're just sitting in awkward silence the whole time. Until right. just this moment, yeah. Uh, in the next page, he said, have you ever been to the Randall Street Projects? The idea was great. Only designers had no concept of what working people needed. They were so excited about their conceits, they forgot people actually had to live there. Yeah, that's, that's true in pretty much every um, city that has them. Yeah, pretty much. The next page, you can just see all these tenement buildings kind of uh, wrapped around what would might might have been a, a nice courtyard in a different part of town, but is basically a trash heap. Here there's overfilling garbage cans, the broken windows... Not some place you'd want to walk without having your tetanus shots up to date. So Bruce says, it looks like a prison. And Deborah says, "Uh uh-huh, that's what it feels like too. And inside, they're walking up some steps. Uh, Deborah Kane is at the top of the landing. Bruce is following. And Deborah says, I should have warned you we'd be climbing 16 flights. No one takes the elevator in these places, even when it is working. 
And Bruce says, because it might fall. And Deborah says, yeah, that too. Almost there. Better stop. Catch your breath. You never know what's behind one of these doors. You could face a fight. Be jumped in the halls. The predators who prey on people stay in shape. You do my job, better be in shape too. So they are at a door and a woman is looking out. She's got, uh, looks like she's got some bruises and swelling on her face. And there's a chain on the door. The woman says, what do you want? And Deborah says, child protective services, ma'am. And the woman says, I didn't call, no. And then this wonderful specimen of a man, he he's in his drink. He's got the little bubbles all around him. So obviously he's been, he's been drinking. Uh, that's how they uh, depict that, I'm guessing. And he says, get away from this door. Yeah, he looks like Wolverine on a really off day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on the next page, we have two panels at the top and then one bigger panel with a tiny little panel inside of it. And on the first panel, we see this guy he, coming out of the door. He He's big. He's a big dude. Very tall. And we see Miss Kane, and she says, As I was just explaining, sir, we're from Child Protective Services. And you saying one of them brats called you, or what? No, sir, I'm not. I am telling you we've received notice of a situation here. If we can't speak with you and the children, we'll return with the police, sir. In the next panel... We we see this guy, he's kind of like ducking in the doorway, and it's from behind him. And he says, ah, do what you want. And the inner dialogue says, or is that inner dialogue? It's the, it's the little kid's dialogue from the next panel. Ah, so we we have a little kid saying, I didn't want him to hit Scotty. Scotty's just a baby. He could be hurt real bad. And the next panel, we're in the little girl's room. She, she's she got some posters up. There's one of a unicorn. I love it. And, she, you know, she's got her teddy bears on her bed. And she's sitting there with uh, Miss Kane. And Miss Kane says, Does he hit Scotty a lot, Mary Lou? And she responds, Not a lot, I guess. I don't know. She asks, Does he hit Scotty every day? Sometimes when he cries or if he spills something, you know. Well... Does your daddy hit anybody else? And then we we cut to the smaller panel, and it's a close-up of the little girl. And she says, he hits everybody. My heart's breaking, I'm sorry. The next page is broken down by three panels on top, one large panel on the bottom. Just then, the burly man enters. The bubbles still surround his face. He says, would you tell her? Answer me. Deborah says, we'll discuss that later. Right now you can... But in the next panel, he abruptly backhands the little girl. To which you would think there would be some action here going on at this point. But Bruce merely gets up, turns him around, and, and says, We're going into the other room, just to get ourselves all calmed down. Isn't that right? And the man says, Ow! What? Uh, right, right, right! Now, if this was like 1939 Superman, I could just see him busting him through the drywall here at this point. But this is like, you know, <laughs> kind of a calm scene. Immediately. Immediately, yeah. yeah. He's, he's got him by a good pressure point, though. Yes, I, I would just think I'm trying me on for size. He's escorted out of the room. In the next panel, we see the little bit of progression as uh, I, we have an exchange between Bruce and Deborah. Bruce says, So, what happens to Mary Lou and her little brother? They go to a foster home? Deborah answers, It's not that simple. We don't want Mary Lou separated from Scotty. With foster placement, we can't guarantee that won't happen. She continues, And more to the point, neither child wants to leave. They want Daddy to be like he was once before. He lost his job and started drinking so much. And then we see a bunch of photographs surrounding the panel, one with the father dressed as Santa, embracing the kids, happier times with the kids on the shoulders at a beach outing, and one uh, with the little girl giving uh, her dad a little uh, hug. Okay, that's sad. That's a much different impression that you come away from with that guy than you do in the novel. Yeah. Those photos like that. And that's an interesting choice for an adaptation. Mm-hmm. All right, the next page is broken up. We've got three panels on top, four panels on the bottom. Uh, at the top, we've got Bruce. <laughs> he looks kind of like he's had some plastic surgery done. There's just something with his eyebrows going on there for the profile. Whatever. Anyways, but he and Deborah Kane are in the car, and he's saying, I talked to him in the other room. He kept saying, they used to respect me. That's what he kept saying over and over. And Deborah. 
I'm glad you were there. I'm glad you came. I still don't know why you went out with me. I mean, because now's the time to start flirting. But, but it's all right if I do it again. Hey, and apparently something catches her eye. And so, and because she says, "Hey," it's a montage. And then we're down here. Oh. Okay. Oh, the hey! I don't know. What the yeah, she said, "I don't." Whatever. Anyways, but hey, if you've got the stomach for it, if you've I've got, got the time. Oh, I see. Mm-hmm. If you've got the stomach for it, I've got the time. Okay. And then we do have like a montage of just people down on their luck. We've got a woman with her head in her hands, crying, and a couple people who just look generally rather downtrodden and upset. Bad things going on. I wonder what mm-hmm. song is playing during this montage. Not a happy one. Nope. Mm-mm. If somebody really dropped the ball and accidentally put you're the best around in the midst of <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh. Did we lose Cat? Cat! Oh, I think we did. Oh, no! Yeah, go ahead and continue, and I'll message her and see if she can call back in. All right. Continuing on the next page is five panels of roughly equal size and rectangle at that. Uh, we first start with a view from outside of a diner in... Is it raining or is the... No, I guess the I think that's just glass, glass is just dirty. You hear two people talking, one of whom you infer is Bruce saying, Is it always like this out there, Deborah? I mean, I know what you, I know what you mean. And Oh, the other one must be Deborah then, who said, I know what you mean, and okay, it gets more or less intense depending on a lot of things. But what you've seen is about normal. He said, normal, being whipped with an electrical cord, scalded with third-degree burns, sodomized by an uncle, geez, comic, (laughs) all that and more. It doesn't seem possible. It doesn't seem human. I'm afraid it's classically human, Bruce. Remember the man in the nice apartment? He committed incest with his daughter, his own little girl, remember? You said that was sick. Well, isn't it? What I'm trying to tell you is you have sick confused with sickening. People like that hurt children for their own pleasure and their own profit. I'm confused. He said he loved her, that he was just, oh, this is the beginning of that Andrew Vax thing where nobody in the entire book finishes a sentence from this. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) He said the same way he'd love a juicy steak for what? (laughs) Oh, he loves that child the same way he'd love a juicy steak. I don't think your metaphor came across. Your simile is very good there, but uh, for the pleasure, it gives him nothing else. That girl will carry that ugly weight for the rest of her life. Welcome back, Kat. Sorry about that. I'm back. Uh, she never continues. It doesn't matter what laws you choose to govern your laws of God, the laws of nature, the laws of mankind. Incest viol- violates them all. Yeah. It's not sick, Bruce. It's evil. Okay. So we have a few panels overlaid, some larger ones on the next page. Deborah gets up from the booth and is uh, kind of shrugging on her coat. And Bruce is starting to rise from the table. And she says, I'm sorry. I know you mean well, but I really can't talk about this anymore tonight. Bruce says, sure, I understand. Can I come along again sometime, Deborah? And Deborah says, if you really want to do that, yes. And Bruce is kind of remembering, remember the man in the nice apartment? But now he is no longer Bruce, he is Batman. So these thoughts are going through his mind as he's going through the rainy rooftops. And his inner narrative says, I took an oath. The authorities already know about him. I can't just... And then he remembers some narrative that he heard earlier in the day. I love my daughter. I love her in a way you could never understand. She's my little girl, aren't you, baby? My little girl. My little girl. My little girl. Batman becomes so enraged that he flails his cape in a dramatic gesture and thinks to himself, It's not enough. Big whoosh. That, sorry, that's all I thought when I saw that was big one. I, thought, I am vengeance. I am the night. <laughs> right. I am powerless <laughs> in the face of systemic problems. <laughs> <laughs> that's also really good. On the next page, we see Deborah walking off into an alleyway. And she's saying, Great, Deborah, maintain that professional look even up to your ankles and muck. Next time you break off an evening with someone, do it closer to your car. Oh, very true. Very true. Wait, and Bruce just let her wander off into what was a rain a second ago? He had to go change into Batman. Again. Yeah, he went to change as Batman. Priorities. And, and pose. He had to pose. And Batman and then... considers just making sure she gets there without getting mugged and or beating up the person who's trying to mug her due diligence. 
should he walk her there or run and get changed, strike a pose, and wait in case she does get mugged so then she, he can swoop down his back? It, exactly. It depends on the mood you're going <laughs> for for your story that's trying to raise awareness for the problem of child abuse. I mean, also very true. Yeah. She gets to her car and she says, at least the rain has stopped. Bruce Wayne is a nice, thoughtful guy that doesn't walk women to their cars just because this job gets to me. No reason I have to take it out on him. And we cut to a close-up of her. And she's going, what? I wonder what's going to happen. <laughs> 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 we cut to the first of the two long panels. And she's looking to the side and we, we see a, a buff dude with like orangey hair. And she says, what do you want? Not much, sweetheart. Just you, if you catch my drift. And she says, come on, then. And in the next panel, she, she kind of looks like she's dropping a purse and getting ready to fight. And he says, easy, baby. No use to rush things. How about you just... And then in the next panel, we see those teeth. Batman is up behind them. And he says... Your partner ran into a problem. He'll be a little late for your meeting. And the uh, guy that's trying to attack Deborah says, Huh? Yeah, Batman's looking at Deborah going, You're handling this just fine. <laughs> 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 You're doing great. The next page has six panels. It's sort of evocative of vintage uh, 1977 Marshall Rogers uh, with the way it's uh, the fight, initial fight scene plays out in the first three panels. One is a long horizontal grid, and we see the attacker swing a chain, and we get the sound effect of rang with three A's to emphasize the sound. Not sure that a swinging chain makes that sound, but there you have it. <laughs> Batman counters Close in the next panel. Close enough. Batman counters in the next panel with a left to his jaw, making a quad sound effect, which I've never seen in a comic book before, but here we go. <laughs> I think KWUD is a uh, call letters from a Seattle radio station, but we know. <laughs> Pay and the next one is from across the river. <laughs> yes, that's right. There you go. I think I saw Quad in the Elmer Fudd Batman team up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> or oh. even the noise where oh. he's speech. Yes. That, and what that is, would make sense in the Elmer Fudd team up, wouldn't it? Yeah. What is all this Quad? Okay, go ahead. What is all this Quad? <laughs> <laughs> Then, in the next panel, we get a wonk, W-N-K. Easy listening until yes. 3 a.m. with Delilah. Sorry. <laughs> W-U-N-K. And our West Coast affiliate, K-W-U-D. <laughs> Wood wonk. Wood wonk. The voice of the 80s. The final fight panel with the wonk, Batman takes his left leg quite muscular and we get to see a little bit of a backside of batman and as it's tilted and he just takes his left leg and just whacks uh, the mugger right across the upper chest the panel sequence continues with the final three panels she says thank you but i believe i could have batman cuts her off i don't think so there's another one in the back of your car he was supposed to take you from behind he continues while carrying the guy over his shoulder he says two attempted rapist down and restrained near the alley between 48th and 49th. Ice pick in the intended victim's right tire. Should have some prints on the handle. I presume he's talking to cops. We don't know. <laughs> if it was some like, internal radio there, the system that he might have. In the final horizontal panel, Batman kind of gives her a smile, sort of like uh, one of those you'd, you'd see in a uh, grade school reader where he's reassuring her, and he says, I hope you don't mind leaving your car. The police will need a, to go over it for evidence. She says, no, that's... Fine, but how will I... Then Batman cuts her off and he says, I'd be honored to escort you. Mm. Oh, now... Okay, okay, wait. So he will let her walk alone when he first <laughs> away. But when he's Batman, he's all like, yeah, let me let me get the Batmobile. I'm going to give you a five-star treatment. You know... Would you like to know my <laughs> secret identity? So yeah, so then we've got one, two, three, fourteen tiny panels at the top little one in the middle and a big one in the bottom, like two-thirds of the page. But it's just the first panel is Batman going click on the utility belt, and then the Batmobile, like an RC <laughs> car, coming to him in a haze of smoke. He's got to get that engine checked, because that's really polluting. Uh, and then with a shh, the 
I guess the cockpit opens. <laughs> it's like she and Gil are reading it. <laughs> and he gestures towards the car with Deborah, kind of with a goldfish look on her face, and says, "With your permission." You suave motherfucker. All right. <laughs> <Get> a <little> smoothie. <laughs> he has like the longest cape since Kelly Jones drew it. That's gonna get tangled in oh, stuff. Yeah. That's a wicked oh, big cape. Oh my god, I didn't even notice that because yeah, yeah. I thought it was part. No, and it's it's, it's been like throughout kind of. It, it sort of looks like a bat a lot of the time, which I get. I get it. But I'm just saying, it's kind of. That's not practical. It's right. not yeah. practical. And think of how much crap Alfred has to clean on the underside where it trails across a G- Gotham City. And it is Gotham, so there's gross stuff all over the ground here. They did. Probably picking out hot used needles and yeah. c- used it, condoms. It kept he, it was just like can use condoms Lame. too. <laughs> <laughs> and he can't go through like a rotating door ever because he'll just get stuck in it. <laughs> like just imagine him. Like planting a foot down and going to do like a roundhouse kick, but he planted his one foot on his <laughs> cape and then he just like swishes and falls flat on his face. Oh, Jesus. Chuck Norris would be embarrassed for him. Uh, so on the next page, we have uh, two horizontal panels at the top and three vertical ones on the bottom. Uh, the entire action is Batman and Deborah in the Batmobile. The first panel has the two of them um, see, seeing the two of them sitting in it. The second one shows the Batmobile itself driving along. And the third panel has a picture of Batman. The next, Deborah, and the third, the Batmobile again. As this conversation unfolds, Deborah is impressed with the Batmobile, saying, "This is amazing! I can't believe I'm here. I feel like like I did when I was a little girl. My first ride on the Ferris wheel. Can I just say, considering what just happened?" To- she seems pretty relaxed now. <laughs> well, yeah. I guess when Batman comes and saves you, you're like, I guess I'm all right now. That's true. Yes. I mean, she has seen some shit, so. That's all. Yeah. I would like to note that, so, like, Deborah could fit into, like, Batman's shoulders, like, three times. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, there's a bit of perspective on that, and Batman seems to be about. He looks like the size of a gorilla. Yeah. He's enormous. <laughs> There's so much to look at, she says. All those lights and panels. What? All right. She's easily distracted. How do you see behind you, she asks. Batman, uncomfortable with all of these questions about how he operates, decides to answer. (laughs) Hey, Cams, people can't see in, but we can see out. The viewpoints are one way. Lexan, bulletproof. The entire vehicle can withstand anything from small arms to missiles. Great. Handy. Handy. All right. Is all that necessary in Gotham? And he's yeah. like, haven't you, haven't you lived here and, and seen the worst places <laughs> of it on a regular basis? <laughs> you just got a, you just got barely avoided getting raped by two people a yep. second ago. Yeah, we, I'm pretty sure. Right. I don't know why I asked your job and mine probably overlap more than I like to think. Well, no. but, <laughs> hold on, Miss Kane. What's wrong? I'm not sure, but probes are picking up something over on... <laughs> I'm so glad John got this page. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it's up to you guys to figure out what that means. Moving on. Just, just the inflection, as you said, probes. <laughs> the probes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just I just watched Empire Strikes Back the other day, so I'm, I hear probes. I'm Actually, my... Mine doesn't go as dirty as it normally would have. I'm just thinking he's got little <laughs> tiny um, Imperial probe droids that are going to shoot at Chewbacca and explode. That's obvious. Uh, no, my mind goes dirty. It, it always is. Same lane. So on the next page, um, we see the Batmobile powering through the streets, smoke billowing behind it. She says, there's something ahead, crowd of some kind. Batman says, right, we'll circle around, pull in the alley across the street. We see Batman and Deborah Kane in the cockpit of the Batmobile. And Deborah asks, What's going on? A mean looking crew, but in this neighborhood, Batman says, Watch. So we see a woman in a an orange blouse tied up to her midriff and a mini skirt and some fishnets, and she's walking amidst a group of some some uh, rough looking guys. Off panel, Deborah says, That girl, Batman, these guys are street thugs, human predators. And Batman says, Watch, Miss Kane, coming toward her from the other way. Something's happening here. Something's 
right on the nose. And we see a man in a wheelchair coming up behind the onlookers. Can I just say you know, that when I read the book, and even I'm seeing on the next pages here as well, this was the weirdest book for me. It seems so out of place, and it seemed like Vax thought that there needed to be another action scene after this. But it's like Batman introduces these, like, well, keep reading. I'll say it when we get to it. That's... Yeah, I, I thought so too. And plus, like, how did surveillance pick up around street corners? Because it was several blocks away, if Broke I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he, he has he them all over the city. It's a very deep probe. He's just probing the city everywhere. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> 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 it's too late at night for this. Um, so on the next page, we see Batman next to Deborah, and he says, I see your profession has taught you a lot about people. Stay here. Don't be alarmed. And she says, why would I? And then all of a sudden, Batman jumps out with a foom. And in the next panel, we see him probably a good, like, 35, 40 feet just above the Batmobile from jumping. He ejected. Maybe. In some way. <laughs> Either okay, that. I mean, this is pre no bad guy drops. days. I don't think he can launch himself that high yet. Like a woodcock. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my <God>. Deep cut. <laughs> and next we see him kind of doing a somersault, and he lands on his feet right in front of the guy in the wheelchair. Ooh, I get action in this one. Okay. In the next page, we've got six panels, and the first opening two on the upper row. The man in the wheelchair pulls off the blanket from his lap, revealing a shotgun. Batman leaps. The shotgun fires, but he fires it in the air as Batman connects with his jaw, and it makes a goom. Not to be confused with a Jack Kirby Marvel monster from Tales to Astonish or Amazing Adventures from the early 1960s. I understood that reference. I knew you'd get it, John. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, man. Suddenly, there's gunfire. Batman turns in the middle panel. Guns fired. Chaka, 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 chaka. Batman ducks under the gunfire. In the final two panels, in the first one, Batman says, Drop it, Rose. It's all over now. And then we see in the last panel, Rose is Glenn blaring, You got that right. I Ooh. like that last panel Matt. a lot, actually. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> weird. And <laughs> here's this person, Rose, we've just met, and she's got, Rah! <laughs> how he knows her name. But I'm more intrigued by the top panel where Batman kicks the guy and apparently makes his head explode. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. think that was the shotgun going off, wasn't it? But the way it's colored oh, makes I it see, look. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> He's good at having heads disintegrate. There's a second time that's happened. Uh, like, there's just, there's his shoulders, there's no head. I also gotta say that Batman isn't gonna do his reputation of some, any favors, but where some folks refer to him as just being a rich man that beats up the mentally ill, uh, by kicking a guy in a wheelchair in the face. You know, that, that story's gonna get around out of context, and that's all, that's, that's the part that's gonna stick. I know for a fact yeah. he has other ways of disarming someone, especially with a long weapon. It's easy to get around that, but... It's Batman. He's going to do it with flair. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm looking through the next page, and I'm not entirely certain I know what's happening. Because a gun is fired at someone, and then in the that's in the top panel. Okay, so she was shooting a gun. She was shooting a gun, but I thought she had it aimed at Batman, so I'm not sure who the guy in the jeans is. He's dead now. Yeah, he's not around well, anymore. <laughs> Except that... That, because, okay, so then Batman chucks... Is That's that a big, big, a big batarang? Force perspective. Okay, Oops. and then Rose wrapped up with a rope and drops her gun. That's and, a good throw. And then Gary, <laughs> who I guess was not the guy who no, just no. got shot. No, Gary's in the wheelchair. Gary's in the wheelchair, and, he, and Batman says, Give it up, Gary, as he's reaching for his gun. So he knows Rose and Gary. He knows Rose and Gary. Apparently he's encountered these people before. On a first name basis. First, on a, that close, yes. He's the godfather for their children. I don't know, the bat father for their children. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's he's got Rose in his arms, who I guess was knocked unconscious by the force of the rope being wrapped around her legs. And she's and says, not tied up. And she's now not tied up. And he says, the police are here. And then Gary looks very ashamed of himself <laughs> as Batman walks away. I assume still with Rose in his arms saying, 
you'll be no good to Rosie dead. Oh, I want, it must be some kind of a domestic dispute that spilled out onto the streets? Well, let's find out. On the next I'm page... I'm sure the next page will explain what just... I'm trying to figure out how how Rosie lost her fishnets, too. Oh, and she didn't have yeah. fishnets on it. Yeah. <laughs> they came off with the rope, I guess. That's a pretty, pretty slick trick, yeah. Who did she shoot? Because there's Gary with the checker and the jeans. Well, yeah, there's a bad be like a shoot. crowd of people in the background. Did she just that... fire at someone randomly? Look, there's know. all these people of the. There's all this whole crowd. If we go back a couple of pages, there's this like huge like yeah, motley trying, crew of ne'er do wells. I'm trying to like, find the jeans that match the panel. That guy. Maybe it's that dude with the blonde but hair. But then why did she shoot him? Yeah, the guy. If I remember from the novel, Gary and Rose are kind of in on a like a not quite a con game together. So she walks out and draws people's attention, and then while people aren't looking, Gary kind of comes up behind, and I'm not sure exactly what they do, but they're actually a team, and so when uh, Gary was trying to reach for the gun, Batman's just like, let the game go, because you're going to get yourself killed, and you won't be any good to her dead. Dead, okay. Yeah, on the next page... Back in the car. That is that is uh, what we find out. And the Batmobile is much roomier in this panel. And, man, <laughs> due to some um, weird inking in the first panel and the fourth panel from the top, if you look at it wrong, it looks like Batman has a big stinking grin on his face. It does kind of, like, <laughs> it's like went. yeah. I did good. <laughs> Every now and then, I get to punch a guy in a wheelchair. Those days and days that make this over. So hard, his head falls off. Okay. Batman explains to this in this... We've got uh, uh, five horizontal panels of the two of them talking back and forth, interspliced with scenes from the outside with that ever-present smoke coming out of the Batmobile. See, I gotta tell you, it's, it's getting good. darker and darker in everyone, so Batman's really gotta get this car checked. He'd be kind of easy to follow, wouldn't he? Yeah. So just follow that trail of smoke that goes off into the distance. That massive plume of smoke. But Batman mm-hmm. explains uh, through the next one that they are partners. They're partners in murder. They're professional killers, and both of them. Uh, so what was all the she says, but Batman interrupts. He wasn't done talking. <laughs> <He's so laughs> like, I don't know yet. At least well, I don't know yet, but still, that wasn't enough. I would punch the dude. <laughs> I don't know yet, but I really went all out to take this guy out. Um, anyway, uh, at least one of the street corner crew did something to someone, something bad. My guess is rape because it's the 1990s and that's the go to, and we've already had that twice in this one, so why stop now? Mm-hmm. Uh, so somebody hired Rosie and Gary for revenge. Uh, they've worked this before. Everyone's eyes are on Rosie, so no one sees Gary coming. I can see why they call her the Riveter. No, no, they call her the Riveter because it's a pun off of Rosie, Rosie the, the Riveter, Riveter from the posters. Keep up. Disappointed that Deborah's lack of That's nuance. Everyone, man's eyes are glued to. Her. Okay, fine. It's a pun. There we go. But she's got the wrong pun, and you'll see in yeah, a second. Yeah, and then ba- Batman says the name's not for the way she looks; it's for the way she shoots. Neat as a row of rivets. Okay. Oh, that's three different things. Okay, let's just go Vox. That seems odd, but so apparently the guy that she shot was the intended. I see. Target. target. Okay, so yeah. Batman, the assassins then? They were um getting paid by someone to assassinate that dude for raping someone. Oh. And Batman. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that part. Time to stop them, but he. Should Sure, beat them up. Yeah, I guarantee when they get to court, he'll try to take all the weight off Rosie and put it on himself. He may be in a wheelchair, but you can always count on him to stand up. <laughs> oh, wow. That's bad. And then he mused to himself, maybe if I wasn't a guy who dressed up in a bath, they, the district attorney would have a better time putting these people away. But, but then she asks, can I ask you something? Oh, she says, can I ask you something? He answers on the next page. We'll find out from Lane. Uh, we have three horizontal panels and then four vertical ones at the bottom. So uh, Batman and Deborah Kane are continuing their conversation and all this. In the first three, they're still in the Batmobile. And Deborah says, they knew they were going to be caught, didn't they? I mean, not at first, but when you showed up, when they couldn't get away, then, right? Right. So why did they keep on? If they had just stopped, they would have been arrested, but not for murder. Batman says... They're professionals. True professionals. What? Wait. They just shot him in front of a whole bunch of people. 
<laughs> they they got they they did a job they got paid for. They're true professionals. Batman admires they their would craft. Still, very easily be convicted for murder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're not very good professionals. So Deborah says, "I have an idea. You just didn't happen to be at my car tonight." No, I wanted to talk to you about the work you do. I know from my sources you are a person of deep conviction, and my sources are impeccable. As accurate as if I had been watching you with my own eyes. Funny you should say that. Another man <laughs> happens to be in my life. And also wants to follow me around. He says, hey, wait, you're, Brad, you're Bruce Wayne. <laughs> He's got that same dimple, too, by God. You're, you know, you're the same height. As... <laughs> you know, I've sat across a car from Bruce Wayne for two solid weeks, and it's weird. You're the exact same height. <laughs> So Deborah gets out of the Batmobile. Batman's still sitting in there, and she says, "Would you like to come up? I could." And surprisingly, Batman says, "Yes, I would." <laughs> There's one small thing that would make it a bit easier. What's that? Leave a window open. So Deborah goes up to her apartment, and there is a Batman squatting on her windowsill. <laughs> Because he can't use doors? I'm confused. I mean, he's Batman. He has to be sneaky about entering buildings, I guess, but... I have to be goddamn extra. He's super creepy in this. <laughs> I mean, I guess it would look a little odd if he kind of walked into the apartment building with her and rode the elevator up and just <laughs> twiddling their thumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose. <laughs> that, that happened but in I Dead Letter know, Office like... where the, we were wondering how he got into the hospital room and it was probably this oh, way. Oh, but through the window. But I, I gotta oh, wonder... Oh, we lost her again. Yeah, she'll be back. I gotta wonder what she was gonna say, though. Would you like to come <clears> up? I could, I could what? You could what? What were you gonna... Fruit Loops? Like, get him a bowl of cereal? Like, what were we gonna do here? I don't know. No I one could. finishes a sentence for the entire thing. They it, get interrupted. It drives me kind of nuts it's, as I'm reading it. Like, just the constant... It, and I get what they're doing. Like, it's the certain kind of dialogue cadence thing that they're going for, but it's just... It annoys me. Oh, yeah, and especially since it's Vax, and it's that sort of... um that sort of crime novel. I've read some of his other novels, and like the dialogue and all of them, they interrupt each other. Yeah. Do they? Oh, oh. To thank. To be honest, I couldn't finish the book because of that. Eventually, because it just got more and more egregious. And then when we did that one on your show where we got did the the rest in peace theater, I was like, uh-huh. oh, God, <laughs> finish a goddamn sentence. I can't. So my mom was a retcon superhero. Yes, sir. Spoilers. Sorry, my internet keeps cutting out because I have the worst internet on the in the world, and like I think everyone in the house is using it right now. We okay. still like you, cat. Yay! Okay, so am I still getting this next page with the the six panels? Yep, you came back okay. just in time. Perfect, y'all didn't steal it from me. Okay, <laughs> so on the next page we have two, four, six panels, and we are in a a apartment. Ooh, fun. Batman makes house calls now. He came in through the window. You missed it. (laughs) I mean, I do see that, but you know, he makes house calls now. That's great. That could be useful for another side job, but we won't get into that right now. It looks like Deborah is bringing out some refreshments, probably some like water or tea or something. On a fucking tray. (laughs) You know, all fancy like. And she says, are you sure that's all I can get you? Just a glass of And then in the next panel, we see her up close to Batman, handing him the glass. And she says, water? What the hell is going on here? (laughs) It's innuendo for something, but I don't want to, I think that's code for something. Water? That's like the sexiest thing she can come up with. (laughs) He asks for the glass of water, actually. Listen, nothing is sexier than staying hydrated. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that is true yeah i was gonna say she's not wrong i need to make my throat moist here wait before we go any further let me down this entire thing <laughs> <laughs> i went down the wrong pipe i'm sure you could help with that i mean wait what uh you said you wanted to talk mm-hmm, i'm sure he wants to do more than talk i didn't say anything of the sort <laughs> In the next panel, we we see Deborah. She's sitting down in a, a green chair, and Batman's behind her. And he says, "Yes, there are things I need to understand. Is it true there's no such thing as as a born criminal? No genetic factor, I mean." And Deborah says, 
It's absolutely true. The idea of the bad seed has been scientifically disproven for decades. We go to the next panel, and the background is just black and white, and we see more of a close-up uh, side view of Deborah's face. People who oppose social programs still spout such nonsense, of course. After all, if children can be born bad, why spend money on education, healthcare, or public housing? Or, and then off panel, Batman says, Child Protective Services? And she says, Right. And we cut to a wider shot, and it's so, so funny to me seeing Batman in this very, like, pastel-y, like, cute apartment. Like, the, the carpets are pink, her lamp is pink, the wall is, like, a really light, almost lavender color. <laughs> and then there's just Batman. Batman is totally clashing. And he says, if criminals are made, then, isn't it true abused children grow up to be criminals? And Deborah says, that is not true. Child abuse contributes to adult criminally, but it's not that simple. Abuse can push two simil similarly maltreated children in opposite directions. And in the next panel, we get an outside view of the apartment, so it's not anything real great. Uh, it's just, you know, the, the brick building. One incest victim becomes a promiscuous adult. Another never engages in sex again. But most victims don't become criminals. What confuses me is this, Miss Kane. Every time I questioned a serial killer, child abuse was in his background. Doesn't that mean... And it continues on the next page. It says, No, there is always a choice. If you excuse a serial killer because he was tortured as a child, you disrespect the thousands of children who were treated even worse and never, never imitated their oppressor. And in the next panel, we see that Deborah's electricity check for the bill for the light uh, cleared because we get to see Bayman's <laughs> face. So it was uh, darkened in the one previous page. So Bayman says, I apologize. I wasn't drawing conclusions, just asking for answers. I fight crime. That's what I do. At least that's what I thought I was doing. Now what I think I am doing is fighting criminals. I think you and people like you are fighting crime. The next panel, Bateman continues, and he gives her a slight bow. I'm grateful to you, Deborah Kane. Interesting that he uses his first and last name, being quite formal. And he continues, You taught me that many abused children refuse to imitate the oppressors when they become adults. But you also taught me some go even further, though, don't they? She says, y y Yes, they do. On the bottom panels, start with this sequence. Bateman says... And it looks like uh, he's bowing to her again, and Deborah's touching, I presume, what is his hand? I don't know. And he says, you have my deepest respect. One warrior's respect for another. Close-up of Deborah's face. Thank. And then the next panel, Bayman has suddenly vanished. And Deborah concludes her statement, you. Wait, oh, wh hang on. What? What What happened there? I mean, in the other... Uh, Bat I mean, it's supposed to depict Batman did his mysterious vanish without anybody notice thing. But she's looking right at him. But she's looking right at him. He's <laughs> holding her hand. What What are we supposed to presume happened in Paige where we're seeing the potted plant? She blinked. <laughs> <laughs> or she looks to her left and said, Man, I really gotta water that. <laughs> oh, you're gone. All right. <laughs> He's counting on the fact that albinos tend to have poor eyesight. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I think it's only cats, right? <laughs> uh, I went on a giant rant about this conversation when we covered this in the pros, otherwise known as the part that everybody went to the kitchen to get a snack while John babbled about. Stuff, <laughs> so I won't babble again. No, I fully enjoyed the, the conversation. I was about to say, babble away. Like, I would love to hear that. Uh, well, I'm going to say, I'll say what I need to say about this whole thing, um, either between comics or at the end of the whole thing, because it's all going to get wrapped up in my major thesis about this whole thing. So, On the next page, I'm actually kind of happy because I'm a sucker for the Batmobile, and this is mostly Batmobile. <laughs> the best Batmobile. No, and This I... seems like a third-party Batmobile. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the knockoff Batmobile toy you get in Koreatown. It is, this is the one that you'd get like in Chinatown in New York with some guy like in a trench coat. You want a Batmobile? Those wings on the back, though, if he ever hits a deer... And he happens to like glance off the hood. He's gonna cut the poor thing into thirds. Oh, I have this horrible image of the Batmobile hitting a deer. 
<laughs> it looks like the colorist doesn't realize it's supposed to be that uh, one with the with with his uh, hood on the cover and thinks it's supposed to be like the movie Batmobile. Yeah, it does look a bit like the movie Batmobile. I, but, I think it's the headlights. But, no, it looks I mean, like anyway, a it freaking good. morphed monstrosity where it's... I kind of like the wings. It's like mm-hmm. the one cartoon where um where Etrigan, you know, had to turn it into a <laughs> yeah. into a demon. Rise of Demon Etrigan. So... Uh, he's not in this book, but so Batman's driving through his plume of smoke, and it's just internal. He's he's thinking back on the things that people have said throughout the book so far. So there's always a choice. There's always always a choice. Poverty doesn't cause crime. People cause crime. <laughs> the maltreatment of children is the greatest single contributor to later criminal behavior. Uh, and then we see at the bottom of the page, there's a couple panels, sort of a, again a montage of like the different people he's seen. And the, the little girl saying, Scotty's just a baby, he could be hurt real bad, real bad. And then I think it's that same, or one of the crazy, creepy dads holding his kid. And then we see a baby in a crib completely bandaged up. Oh, jeez. That what says the? real bad, real oh, bad. Oh, my yeah. God. That's a rather specific areas of injury that's being bandaged up. It's odd. Uh, what? Well, it's not, you know, it's supposed to depict a kid who's obviously been beating, but this kid's, I mean, got little band-aids and bandages wrapped around his arms, uh, his strips on his back, his, his eye. Is bandaged, yeah. yeah. I mean, it could be something as, like, specific as, unfortunately, people do put cigarettes out on children, so. Yeah. Yeah, people do some horrible things. Yeah. People suck, man. People do yeah. suck, just in general. Individuals don't, but people overall ain't great. And then the last panel is, and uh, it says, I love my daughter. I love her in a way you could never understand. She's my little girl, aren't you, baby? My little girl, my little girl, my little girl. Never understand, never understand, never understand. So this is obviously, like, haunting Mr. Batman here. And, of course, he has a personality that is never haunted, so I'm sure this is a new experience oh, for him. not at all. Not, like, prone to really obsess over things. Okay. Let me get the bat computer. All right. With this next one and the one before, I just want to... Br- it seems, because I remember when you, you interviewed Vax, I mean, he'd never read a single Batman comic in his life and didn't really know much about him, and they gave him, like, the Batman Bible. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if they decided at so as not to confuse him, they would not, you know, wouldn't give him the parts about the Joker and his various rogues gallery, and they just mentioned that he has a colorful nickname rogues gallery... Because Vax has given him three villains that are so not Batman-related villains. They're barely Daredevil villains. Yeah, like they, like none of the of his classic villains are in this whatsoever. It is a completely isolated, standalone storyline. Which I am happy about for reasons I will explain later. But anyway, Batman is has made it back to presumably, and where he's sitting in front of what looks like a. So where the bat server is the in the bat background. Server, yeah. He must have check out my gaming rig. Uh, Batman. <laughs> so Batman is um, standing behind Alfred and leaning over him as Alfred is trying to log on to the bat internet, which, from <laughs> the looks of it, are actually uh, fairly primitive even for the time because Batman uh, refuses to upgrade past uh, Windows 3.0. Oh, Windows me. <laughs> no, way before that, Windows 94, but 5 was not on him. I really wish this was a gateway computer and it was painted like a cow. <laughs> oh my god. Back in the day. Batman says, that's it, Alfred. Convicts in custody. The man I'm looking for will be inside, no doubt about it. May I ask you who... No, I mean, the middleman. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, then we see a couple of bits of the middleman stats, which I'm gonna... I'm not gonna read all of it, but basically the middleman is in jail for everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's got a whole list Including of his offenses, criminal solicitation, disposal of stolen property, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But basically, it looks like non-violent crimes. Non-violent it looks like, crimes. Good point. Yeah, um, yeah it's it's Crime, things along gambling, those lines: gambling there is offenses, prostitution. The prostitution Money laundering. That could have been. I mean, yeah, it could have been. He was picked up for being a don. A pimp, or was he, or was he prostituting himself? himself? Could be either. Could be both. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, there was no room for the parking tickets. Or, yeah. um, <laughs> just a, but enough nonviolent um, crimes to net him 1,588 years. But then the next page, which I think is the point of all of this, is the actual time to parole eligibility is seven years, four months, and 11 days, which is significantly less than the 1,500 years plus. Uh, his location, narrowcast Hellgate Prison, wing... 
coordinate stuff, he punches it in, and then on the next level of the video game, it'll show him how to get there. Their prison's name is <laughs> Hellgate? Yeah, I don't know why they do that. He just made it up himself, and and it's oh, it okay. has it's a complete coincidence that Blackgate exists because sure. he just basically said, "What's a cool name for a prison? Hellgate." And Doesn't sound like they basically be. gave Batman a maximum security prison. Mm-hmm. It's what he's wanted for Christmas for so long. Which you'd long. think, you know, the way this prison looks set up, or how I remember it being set up, they'd be better off with this prison than actually what they have. Because the cool thing about ma- actual maximum security prison, people don't break out of them every month, you know. Like Arkham? Yeah. System doesn't always fail, Alfred. There's a man who is exactly where he belongs, serving over 1,500 years for doing nonviolent crimes in Hellgate. That's a very good point. Why is this guy in maximum security prison? And for 1,500 years for, sentence for those crimes? I believe I question why he's in max security in my podcast. It's been a few months, so I, but I, I remember thinking, why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really fully make sense to me, personally. I can throw in that right kind of, it might be because they nailed him on Rico stuff. Yeah, but still, fifteen hundred years—that doesn't sound right. Yeah, that's how racketeering stuff works. If if it, if it gets pulled into that into mob court, then he maybe it was his third strike. Yeah. Oh, but the main point after he's looking through all this, uh, it wasn't obvious at first until I just looked at it again. But in the last panel, Batman is back in the Batmobile talking to his probe. <laughs> switch to video. Switch to thermal in the probe. Oh, uh, that looks like a hot polyp. <laughs> the probe's like. Sorry, probe, video, thermal, it's like... <clears throat> so, uh, Batman has his little computer on his console, and instead of playing Sirius XM, he is looking at the barred window of a jail cell. Conscious state of subject, sleep. Depth, REM. An alert goes off. Alert, additional data available. Perry trauma scale available, run. So the new program that Alfred had, or he had Alfred install, the Perry Trauma Scale measures past trauma in a subject. So he's going to run that program now. So he gets the Perry Trauma Scale B3 slash 71 slash C slash NR. B means the second distinct life stage between two and four years old. 71 is the degree of severity. It's chronic as opposed to episodic and NR, not repressed. Something happened to the middleman when he was a young child. Something deeply traumatic. Whatever it was, it's still in his mind. Because that's the only reason he would dream. <laughs> <laughs> when it said new, new information available, I thought it was going to spell out what he's dreaming about. Cause... <laughs> wonder though how he's got anything that would tell him first of all that a subject in a max security prison is asleep and that he's in REM sleep I think that he I don't off. know but mostly we, there it's was a nuts. number of places where all Batman does is just violate people's civil rights yeah it's visual thermal probes <laughs> <laughs> oh it's thermal probe that's how he knows probe, probe. he's telling him he's in REM sleep I guess uh, so uh, he heads toward the prison his cape flowing it's gonna snag on every damn branch he passes i mean it's just it's gonna happen so time to become one with the criminal look at the world through the eyes of the beast itself even if i could get over the wall past the gun towers even i if i could get through the razor wire those dogs would eat me alive what then blackmail bribery corruption give up serve your time fat chance there must be yes of course yeah, so. it's the dogs that'll get you. That's what right. he's worried about. <laughs> what, what is your relationship with law enforcement in this universe? Can't you, like, you know, as Bruce Wayne agree to Adam? He's thinking as the criminal. He's trying to figure out how he, as a as a criminal, might escape. So he, he's he got his uh, nice little goggles of some kind there, some kind of scope. Goggles just... profiling. Don't give me that. Yes. <laughs> That's all they do is profile people. <laughs> He's in the next ep- the next season of Criminal Minds, don't you know? Listen, don't play with my heartstrings in Criminal Minds. <sighs> that that could be an entire tangent, like the one we went off on about Supernatural. Just my love affair with Criminal Minds. I was actually uh, listening to one of the podcasts earlier because Zach, uh, my boyfriend, was like, "Oh yeah, send me a link. I'm finally going to listen to it." 
but I was like, I don't even remember them anymore, so I was listening to one, and we went off on a tangent about how Supernatural was ending, and we had an entire moment where we were saying that if it doesn't end with Dean and Castiel kissing in that fan service, I was rioting, and I basically died laughing. Yes. Yes. (laughs) We want a teeth-gnashing, lip-bruising, wing-pulling kiss, or it's all been for naught. (laughs) <laughs> well, well the, tis the era of fan service in your <laughs> exactly. show, so you might oh. have a shot. Yeah. <laughs> Kat, did you say you like Criminal Minds too, the TV show? Yes. Coincidentally, John, I, a girl I went to high school with at Regis actually appeared in an episode of Criminal Minds. Oh, what what is her name? I think I actually know this. I know this person, or I know of this person. Yeah. They. Uh, Colleen McDonald. That name sounds entirely familiar. I do not know the person, but I remember seeing either on the news or reading in the paper about her and that very thing. Now, did she have a speaking part, or was she dead prostitute number three? <laughs> so the episode that she was in, and now, Kat, I don't know if you're like really well-versed in Criminal Minds, but it was the episode where there's an actress by the name of Adrian Pilecki. Yes! And she... Yes, you know where they play yes. like uh, she's like she's one half of a couple that do the trees across town like that. Her scene is the one where Thomas Gibson and the girl come up to him to this woman who's cutting a hedge, and she says, "Is there something I can do for you?" And he says, "We're trying to find your husband." Oh, well, he should be at work at the gas station. That's Colleen McDonald. So she has just this one line, and she oh, has an exchange okay. with Thomas Gibson. So if you ever watch it again, you know, but uh, that's 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 her. So it's it's hysteric. She looks the same. Unbelievable. So now I'm binging Criminal Minds tomorrow and making sure I watch that exact episode. On the next page, we see Batman. He's kind of reaching up, pressing some buttons. Probe sonar engagement in progress. Please wait. And then next we see a whoosh and a probe sonar engagement is... That's a serious probe. (laughs) ...is completely in progress and it is going up, up, and away. Terribly sorry to interrupt you here, but to the You're absurdity fine. of these two pages have just struck me. When all that is <laughs> all that this is is just showing how he gets outside of the prison to talk to the guy in prison, rather than just showing him outside of the prison hanging there because he's Batman. We know how he got there. Um, and next we see kind of the the silhouette of the bat-like shape, and it says triangulation in progress. Please wait. And next we see the, like, a computer just chilling. And it says, <laughs> imaging, please wait. It's been a long day. Inanimate objects are just chilling to me. Triangulation in place. Select dimension. Selected. Depth. Is this correct? And next we see Batman. He's kind of, like, crouching next to the uh, Batmobile. I was right. A tunnel. About 10, 12 feet short of the wall. Whoever's been working on on this one, has been at it a long time. And next we see him, he's got his jet pack on. He says, Sorry to have to spoil your fun, gentlemen. And then we we see him either taking off, I think he's taking off or landing, and he, he's got his bat wings just whoosh! His cape becomes rigid, like in the uh, Dark Knight oh, yeah. trilogy. It's kind of cool. Fox actually did, to his credit, every time he described how Batman did stuff, slash trained, slash what he had, was pretty amazing. You know, considering especially he'd never read the any of the comics of the character. He came yeah. up with all of these really realistic, you know, ways of this weird elaborate training session he goes through, and that was fun, and then this kind of thing, which he just made up on his own. And I think a lot of that is kind of uh, his own personal experience, because he had some weird connections with, like, like, people going into Africa and Legionnaire-type stuff, and he he's kind of a badass. So all respect to Andrew Vax for being a badass. <laughs> On the next page, we got Batman, and it, this basically consists of three panels and, and uh, a couple of uh, a few thought boxes. And Batman's flying, and it looks like he can remotely control. You know, he's got like these arm controls that he's holding on to as he's flying uh, over and heading towards the prison. And somehow these jets are blazing, yet uh, Batman remains unscorched, as, as does the, the cape and uh, his costume and everything else, because that's just comic book science going on here. And we saw him. We saw them try to light him on fire in the first couple pages and it didn't work. So this is just a callback. There you go. So he's circling the prison, and of course the searchlights from the prison don't find him. The internal thoughts uh, go as follows. Hellgate Prison, restricted to criminals, considered extremely dangerous. 
or an escape risk, as opposed to any other prison. Hellgate is the garbage can of criminal justice system. A Max Max institution without pretense, as opposed to a Min or Mini Max. He continues, Hellgate is a cage, a cage for beasts. Then Batman is just about to land on the prison, and he makes a successful landing, and his internal thoughts conclude, there is only one way in, and no way out. Oh my goodness, I just realized something. There's a waning crescent moon. I thought only full moons Holy cow. Yeah. It's true, though. Now we're oh going to go nice back and lane. <laughs> <laughs> it's not only in Gotham, it's wherever Batman is, even if he goes to Europe. Yes. So we have a silent panel. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six panels on this one, all equal size, nice little neat squares. The first one is a silent panel with Batman scaling a wall with a little hook in his cape. Mm -hmm. And his internal dialogue says, I had the search and rescue disc, SRD, he thinks to himself. (laughs) (laughs) In parentheses, he has a parenthetical thought there. (laughs) (laughs) So I had the search and rescue disc designed to aid in rescue efforts such as a mine cave-in. Oh, I had the search and rescue disc designed to aid... Okay, I, I was putting commas where there weren't any commas. Placed against an outside wall, or glass over the bars, I guess? Rescuers can attain two-way communication with those trapped inside. I remember this part from the book. Yep. Yeah, this is when we were on. Yeah, Chris and I acted out the scene. That's true. And then we acted out the next scene, oh. hope. <laughs> He's saying, is Sistrunk? Is that the dude's name? That, Sistrunk? That's his name. Sistrunk. <laughs> Wake up. I wonder, that's such an odd name. I'll, I'll bet you anything that Vox encountered someone who has that name. Because mm-hmm. otherwise, where does that... Anyways, a uh, sleepy guy in prison says, What's up, uh, huh? Mm-hmm. You, what in all the... Keep quiet, I came here to talk. That's all, middleman. And here's Batman hanging upside down <laughs> in the window with his two-way communicator thing, which, if it was a real thing, would be very cool. <laughs> It looks like a model version of, like, the Millennium Falcon, just kind of stuck. <laughs> Look at my toy. Like, like a little suction cup there. Garfield kind of. Uh, and he says, this is all off the record. Do you understand by that? <laughs> <laughs> I think That's so. what if Stan Lee was writing it, and there'd be an asterisk. He goes, off the record, record refers means. to... <laughs> Dear Stan. readers, yeah, Stan. Uh, yeah, and he and the, the middleman, or Sistrunk, says... Yeah, every pro knows. Whatever I tell you, don't get to the cops. Hell, it don't get to nobody. Poor grammar. You put a lot of guys in here, but it wasn't with your mouth. I assume he means fists? Uh, it wasn't by talking. Oh. Uh, on the next page, uh, we've got three panels along the top, where uh, Batman's hanging upside down, talking to the middleman who's standing up, looking out at him from Batman's perspective, who says, You move contraband, drugs, narcotics, as you know. Anywhere, there's a profit. I'm told there is substantial profit in child abuse. And then I know there's a market for anything if you know where to look. That's what I want from you. I want you to tell me where to look, which apparently shocks the middleman because he's... He's looks, got this... He's like, it's the probe. Does he think that Batman's into this stuff and he wants help? Right. Uh, but anyway, the middleman mm-hmm. lights a cigarette. Mm-hmm. Like you do in prison. Well, you used to be able to, I guess, but I don't think in a Supermax they just gave you them. But there's three ways, right? You can sell pictures of the kids, you can sell the kids' services, or you can sell the kids outright. And then he goes on to describe a whole bunch of awful things, and there's pictures implying what it is. And you know what? If you want to read this, you can do that. Well, let me see, because I haven't looked at the page. Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, kitty porn. Kitty porn, there's the market Baby for that. Rivers. Child molest. Actually, this is a borderline stuff I, that are really, really making me uncomfortable to talk about. So I'm going to paraphrase. Uh, the, the panels are referring to as the, um, the word boxes are kind of in, indicating a narrative of it. But basically, there's a whole bunch of terrible people in the world who uh, want to get involved in various aspects of child pornography or child abuse in that, in that aspect. And this dude apparently uh, was uh, someone who either would put them in touch with that or at least is aware of it. In the bottom panel, as he sits there and smokes with his uh, smoke puffling, puffing up, he said, there's worse than that, though. Some freaks aren't satisfied with just renting a kid. They want to buy one. And Batman, who looks like is now up right side up again. No, he's upside down. Oh, is he still? Oh, there he is. His shoulders right. are up this way. It's a, you mean to keep like a black market adoption? And they said, yeah, dude, that's what I'm talking about. I he said... 
uh, nah, to use any way they want. It's actually kind of a cool shot of uh, him hanging. Yeah, the middleman middle continues, and when they're done, they just throw him away. You mean? Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. Batman says, there's a tunnel, almost to the wall. Prison authorities know about it. Tomorrow, they're going to shut it down. Anyone caught in there will be looking at a lot more years. Middleman says, got it. Fair trade, too, just like he said. And Batman starts to take his leave, and Middleman says, hold on, I got something else, something you ought to know. There's a guy on the West Coast named Draco. He arranges kitty sex tours out of the country. Charges a fortune for it, too. He's always at a place called the Dragonfire Marina. Calls his boat the Lollipop. Tell him a guy named Lester Tuxley referred you. So in the bottom of the page, we see uh, the guard towers. Um, there's a couple guards outside with some rifles. The conversation continues off panel. And where is this Lester Tuxley? Don't worry about Lester. He's in here. Middleman, if I follow through on this and someone checks, hey, did I say there'd be a problem? There won't be no problem. You understand? In the next panel, we see the middleman. He has his hands on the wall. He's clearly just a little frustrated. And Batman says, I understand, middleman. Is there anything I can... And the middleman cuts him off. Nothing. It's on the house. And then, like, Batman kind of, like, reaches his hand down. And the middleman reaches his hand up in the most dramatic way I've seen in a, in a minute. And the middleman says, make them pay. And then we see two pictures... Both of them have kids in them, and we see the words, make them pay again. I'm guessing that's cis drunk as a child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Possibly, yeah. In that the next panel... the implication more so in the book, so I think that's what it's trying to convey, is that yeah. cis drunk was abused. <laughs> in the next panel, we see Bat... Or, well, he's Bruce Wayne right now. He doesn't have a mask on. Um, he is working out in the next two panels, and we see the words, make them pay again. And then we see him shaving, and... The words in this... Make them pay as he punches. Make them pay as he punches. Make them pay as he shaves and cuts a big gash in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he gets those chiseled jaws. He just keeps scraping away at it. Who needs plastic surgery? Just scrape at it with a razor. Oh, God. I wish I'd never said that. Uh, You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Lane. I appreciate it so much. <laughs> Love you. In the early morning hours, an escape tunnel was discovered under the maximum security Hellgate prison. And next we see Bruce. He's just kind of sitting there watching the TV. Warden Richardson, is it true that the body of an inmate was found in the tunnel? Was he? And then we cut and we see the press conference happening. One at a time, okay? The inmate's name was Lester Tuxley. He was stabbed with a shank, probably fashioned in the prison machine shop. What the fuck? Uh, did Tuxley have any known enemies, Warden? Moving right along to the next page, we see that uh, Warden continuing his interview on a television screen that's watched by Bruce on his 12-inch uh, TV. With the finest 12-inch <laughs> TV money can buy. That's right. The Warden continues. I'm sure he did. He was a child molester, an habitual criminal with over 80 victims to his everlasting disgrace. You know, which is things that a prison warden would say in a press conference. <laughs> yes. In the next panel, we see that Alfred has prepared a snack, and he's removing it from uh, Bruce, and he's walking off with it, and he says, A rather unexpected development, isn't it, Master Bruce? Bruce drinks, and he says, Maybe, Alfred, maybe not. And then the page is cut off by four panels, uh, arranged uh, vertically and horizontally. The next one, we find Alfred looking out the window, but then he has his eyes closed, and he looks very uh, sullen and contemplative. Then he moves to a bookcase, and it looks like he uh, arranges, and he, we, we see that he's activating a secret panel. Then a scroll appears that appears uh, to be uh, secured, and then Alfred looks at it solemnly, and he says, Your words, Father, I have not forgot. Then Alfred recites a quote while removing the scroll parchment. A man must stand, and if there is only one man, then that man must stand alone. Then Alfred takes it, and he descends down the staircase. I like that they actually cut down on the level of extra. What was the term we used the most? Goddamn extra hide a key in creation. Yeah, that that took an entire page of him like tapping different parts of the bookshelf and like and putting pieces on a game. Patted his stomach and yeah, oh, Jesus. 
Are we? By the way, are we to imply that Batman just either set up or let that let the dude get shanked in prison there? That's what I'd assume. I think what happened was uh, Sestrunk told him, like, yeah, he's in here. Don't worry about him. So Batman knew he was in there. I don't think he was fully aware what's, what was going to happen. And then, like, when he found out he was killed, he's like, oh, oops. Yeah, doesn't seem too concerned about it. And Alfred seems rather <laughs> smug about the whole thing, too. I was yeah. going to point out one little detail in the panel where Alfred Alfred's, like, um, monkeying about with the, what's it called? Bookshelf. And the only book that you can tell the name of on the spine is one on the lower left-hand side that says Angel. I don't know if that's like the novelization of the television show Angel with David Boreanaz or what, or not. not. uh, Bruce put all of his favorite Angel fanfics into a binder. (laughs) Oh my god, can Mm -hmm. that be canon? Uh, So Alfred's delivering the scroll on a platter like butlers do down in the bat cave, the steampunk bat cave, and he says, (laughs) Master Bruce, and the little interior panel says, a silhouette of um, Bruce Wayne says, Alfred. And he comes in, and Alfred says, I told you once there would be a time. Now is that time, sir. I know you are in pain. It is time you know the cause, the root cause. Depression is no stranger to you. I know how these forays into child abuse investigation have troubled you so deeply. Go figure. It has all come together as I knew it would. It is all connected, and you are at the center. And we've got a close-up of the the scroll on the platter and the back of Bruce's head, and he says, what? And (laughs) we get an extreme close-up of Alfred's face. Yeah, about me, what? (laughs) (laughs) And Alfred says, in the crease, an investigator's journal, sir. Your mother's journal. It is time you knew not just what she did, but who she was. And then as he's walking away from him very dramatically, he says, read it. Read it all. As if Batman wasn't going to read all of it. And then Batman's holding onto the scroll. And then Alfred says, I'll be right here, sir. And Batman looks rather surprised. (laughs) <laughs> and he's like, Alfred, I don't got time for this crap. I got a lot of... This is not the only case I'm working right now. Can you sum up what's in this thing? He also looks no. a good ten years younger in that bottom panel. That is yeah. True. The one we've been teasing, I do like the art a lot more than I thought I would with the initial flip-through. This is pretty yes. standard 90s fare. Uh, oh, you don't, yeah, you don't like much about any comic in the 90s. Uh-uh. So. On the next page, he looks a lot like, like Alfred from the 1960s. Oh. Yeah. On the next page, Batman, with a furrowed brow and head in hand, but still glove on that hand, is reading something that says, Alfred, my true friend, I entrust this journal to you, and with that trust, you're, ple- you're pledged to ple- place them in my son's hands and into no one else's, if for any reason I should not be able to perform this task myself, as we discussed. She has very nice penmanship. She really does. Yes. Time passes until, thank God, I was worried with the pacing of this comic that they were just going to have him like read the entire thing again, and I already had to do that for one of your shows, Lane. So that- Twelve hours later. Uh, Alfred, these journals, they seem unbelievable to me, says Bruce on the left side of the page in a, horror, or in a vertical panel, which is a really nice panel. It's uh, cutting down from the top. You see Bruce, ma- the maskless Bruce with his Batman costume uh, with papers spread out on the time, which looks like someone you know who has been reading much papers would have them but then bruce does that thing that you do after you've read a, a narrative that someone who knew what the narrative said handed to you which is explain the narrative as if someone were reading this uh, i said my mother was an investigative socio oh, right oh yes <laughs> oh, boy. i mean if you have a sociologist who investigates thing i guess you can create the niche of investigative journal sociologist sorry sorry that's literally all sociologists i've i've been reminded by the social people at our at our monthly meetings that to come back you come back and you let them know no i mean she was more like a like a super social worker yeah she's was kind of more what i would have described her as than uh, an investigative sociology that uh-huh. it doesn't matter it's a comic book. My mother was an investigative sociologist. And your father smelled of elderberries. <laughs> <laughs> Uncovering an international ring of pedophiles. She tracked it all up from the roots, the procurers, the photographers, the distributors, everything I never knew. 
Well, yes, Master Bruce, that's a good summary of all of that. I said, your mother didn't want you to know, Master Bruce. She was in great danger. The people she was after would stop at nothing to neutralize her. As the public thinks of Bruce Wayne as a playboy, they thought of your mother as a housewife. Only your father and I knew the truth. But that sounds pretty classist, Alfred. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being a housewife. Many people are rather fulfilled in that capacity. Shut up and keep track. Of, yeah, stick to the point, Master Bruce. Um, she knew uh, some of the people involved. She was the first to understand an organ, the organizational capacities of those who prey upon children. Your mother knew ne- molesters had developed an intricate network that allowed them to manufacture and distribute their filth. The pedophiles, oh, wait, he's British, I'm sorry. The pedophiles had their networks, but your <laughs> mothers and her colleagues had theirs as well. They tracked the offenders, monitored their activities, did a whole it, bunch of stuff that totally happened. And this was before the days of Google and Lexus Nexus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he, uh, we get an overhead shot of Bruce and Alfred sitting at this uh, table. Her work never ceased, Master Bruce. She knew the dangers all too well, but she was a woman of great courage, and she would not be deterred from her mission. So my mother was... was a... a crime fighter, sir. A crime fighter with a secret identity. And we see Bruce Wayne with tears coming from his eyes, and in the next panel he has lowered his head into his hands, and Alfred stands behind him with a supporting hand upon his back. Erstwhile, uh, we see the rain falling outside of Wayne Manor. Batman and Alfred are still in the Batcave. Batman has his cowl on once more, and it, he's starting to cross-index the journal and with his computer. Martha Wayne Journal, sort, search all records, deceased, homicide, gunshot, missing, presumed dead. So pretty much all the people that are mentioned in his mother's journal have been killed. And it looks like we've lost Kat, so does we want to jump to Chris, and then she can pick up if she comes back in. All right. So we get uh, three panels here on this page, and uh, the computer is scrolling through the names. Batman looks over his left shoulder to Alfred, and he says, Only three possibly still alive, and one for certain. Alfred muses, It's been a long time, sir. Batman continues, Do you think any of them knew my mother was on their trail? Alfred, Oh, yes. They knew quite well. Batman, Then that's it. We start at the beginning and let the journal and the computer records find our target for us. The computer scrolls and scrolls and scrolls. Batman, The last name. My parents. My mother's killer. Then with a Grim expression. It uh, looks like a little bit, a little bit of Bill Sienkiewicz here. Got to follow. Got to get all of it. Wow, it's really, really intense there. Yeah. Cat, do you want to take this page forty-three? Okay. So on the next page, the first panel, we see the computer injuries. Case one. N equals eighty-eight. Breakdown by category. GPD seventy-seven. NM thirty-one. And it just, it goes on about all of this stuff. And in the next panel, we see Alfred and Batman. And Batman says, Why would the head of the sex crimes unit be asking about the hunt for my parents' murderer? Besides, he, Alfred, he was the one who... And Alfred says, Go on, sir. Finish it. And in the next panel, we see Batman clearly frustrated, holding on to these papers. It's all here. My mother's journal ties it together. This Lieutenant Horton was mixed up with a woman named Barbara Slocum, a supposed suicide. Before every meeting between them, Slocum's bank received large amounts of money from Udon Kai, a small country in Southeast Asia. All the transactions were reported as gifts from her uncle, one William X. Milady. <laughs> Tips, Fedora. So Malady is the one the computer identifies as still alive, alive and living in Udon Kai. And that money he sent to Barbara Slocum went to Lieutenant Horton for payoffs. Look at the date of the last currency transfer and the biggest, Alfred. That's no coincidence. It's for the killing of Martha Wayne. For the murder of my mother. Can I just ask real quick on the previous page when we're looking at the computer screen? Martha Wayne, MD. She was also a doctor? What? 
Because and then it says Thomas Wayne, MD. That means medical doctor. Well, it doesn't mean yeah. medical doctor. It means something in Latin, I'm sure, but whatever. But yeah, I didn't know that she was. They right. have her listed as an MD. Good catch. Yeah, yeah. Huh. I did. this Martha must, but I thought she was just a housewife who was right. The, well, in in this case, MD stands for Mother Dead. Mother Dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. You almost owe me a new computer screen, right? <laughs> that literally very nearly came out his nose. Uh, I I stopped. I that's actually what I figured out. Like I said, Milady is the one. Or yeah, I said that, and then I was like, wait, what's going on? Wait, uh, nobody's laughing at my joke. What's going on? Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm not that bad. Jesus. Um, in, in the next panel, we get I am. Close I'm up. just I'm projecting. Oh yeah, I mean. Some of my jokes are pretty bad. I'll admit to that. But we cut up to a close-up of Batman's face. And he's saying, Milady is the one the one the computer identifies as still alive. Alive and living in Linden Kai. And that money he sent to Barbara Slocum went to Lieutenant Horton for payoffs. In the bottom panel, we have Batman and he's looking over papers. Look at the date of the last currency transfer. And the biggest, Alfred, that's no coincidence. It's for the killing of Martha Wayne. For the murder of my mother. And then off to the side, we see a picture of the Waynes and a little bit of uh, newspaper about the uh, killing of his parents. Okay, we must be in some part of the Batcave. Alfred and the computer stopper behind us. The massive ballroom gown style cape is kind of flowing out behind Batman. And he says, All my life I have searched for meaning in the death of my parents. In their honor, I have devoted my life to fighting crime. But I haven't been fighting crime, Alfred. I've been fighting criminals. Which, I just want to pause and say, I actually kind of like that he's making this distinction. I think that's kind of cool. That there's a difference between crime and criminals. Right. And Batman punches criminals. He doesn't punch crime. Mm-hmm. Now I know they're not the same. I've wondered why I've become alive only as the Batman. Now I know Bruce Wayne is a hollow man, a convenient disguise. And then in this very triumphant, super muscular pose, which I actually think we've seen before in a previous panel, I think that's actually the exact same art of the one with him on the rooftop I with the still lightning. still vengeance. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure it's the same. Anyways. Um, but he says, the Batman is a warrior. I am a warrior from a warrior descended. The criminal underworld has always feared me. From this moment on, what they need to fear is my mother. The completion of my mother's work. And from elsewhere in the cave, is like, oh, I'm sorry, sir. Is this a new um, addition to your oath? Shall I bring out the candles in the book? <laughs> <laughs> and Alfred fires up the CD player. From this moment, <laughs> light has Christ. begun. <laughs> Yeah, that must have been really awkward for Alfred. Like, okay, well, he's monologuing now, so we'll just wait till he's done. <laughs> he's adjusting the light. Get some backlit. <laughs> All right, on the next page, what the hell is going on? He's jumping through okay, f- it's laser a f- wire. Okay, it's a full splash page, and it shows a fence with a bunch of barbed wire on top and loops. The razor wire. Razor, razor wire. wire, even. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a man. It looks like Batman is hopping into some sort of uh, compound. fortified compound, mm-hmm. uh, and not quite clearing the top. I, yeah, I was just gonna say exactly that. He's it, gonna get it his looks knee like caught. his tights are gonna have a run in it after. <laughs> uh, get the nail polish. But he also yes. he's uh, tossed in some uh, gas pellets, and it looks like uh, part of his left ring finger is fallen off <laughs> at the tip. That's <laughs> Cut on the razor wire on the way over. Uh, anyway. <laughs> That's unfortunate. Batman uh, internally narrates something. Cambridge Muse? <laughs> Meow. Cambridge Muse. <laughs> yep. An exclusive suburb 10 miles from Gotham okay. City. Okay. It's a furry compound. This page makes me think of just like a dance movie and he's like jumping to go onto a dance floor and I'm like expecting like Footloose to start playing. <laughs> What the hell? Now they're just making words up to trip me up here. Uh, I plebiscite. <laughs> seven. It's an address. It's an address. Uh, seven plebiscite. Plebiscite Lane. Vox, what are you doing here? Plebiscite Lane. Home of Alexander Horton, Gotham Police Department, retired. And so retired that he lives in a compound with razor vine in case Batman would ever come for him, but it is to no avail. Okay, we're in the home stretch, peeps. 
Okay, so uh, the person who was gassed as Batman leapt over the razor wire is flat on his back, and in the background we see Batman fleeing toward a house, his cape flying. And then we see we're on in the inside of a fairly lush room of some kind. There's some big plants, there's some nude photos on the wall, there's a chest of drawers with clothing hanging out of it, and there's a man, a large man sitting in like some kind of pajamas or something, and the top is open, and there's a woman standing with a red robe and high heels, and the robe's belt is uh, in the man's hand, and the man says, do you like the present doll? And she says, oh, you know, I do, Alex, it's beautiful. Well, then how about letting me see it a little close? And before he can finish that thought, something uh, gets their attention because they both start and turn to look behind him. How the hell? And they're alarmed because there's a Batman in their room. Your security guard's asleep on the job. And the man with the, the robe is reaching for a gun. Instead of securing the weapon, Batman instead punches him in the sternum. (laughs) Right. The logical thing to do. (laughs) So give the gun a rest to drop it. So uh, the woman is standing behind the chair. The man's sitting in the chair, a little cowed by Batman, who is leaning menacingly over him. He says, what do you want with me? Batman says, I want some answers, Alexander Horton. Off the record, do you understand what that means? This is like a magical phrase for him. All he has to say is off the record. Do you know what that means? I think he's asking them for clarification. The thing I say to you is off the record, Batman. Batman. You're wearing a damn mask. <laughs> it ain't like you're showing up to testify. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he's wanting someone to answer that for him because he himself doesn't know what off the record he means. He just thought it sounded cool. Well, yeah, we're yeah. in luck because the next panel... <laughs> Tells us again what it means. And in the next panel, we see... What's his name again? I'm bad with this. Uh, Horton. Him, yeah. (laughs) He says, yeah, I know what off the record means. Anything I tell you stays right in this room. You got a deal, pal. Ask away. And next we get a nice close-up of Batman's face. He says, Joe Chill, who paid you to kill him? I know about Barbara Slocum. I know about you. And I know about the payoffs. I'm only asking once, Horton. And then we cut to see a further away angle of Horton and Batman, and we kind of see the girl's face on the left-hand side. Batman says, who paid you? Horton says, hey, okay, it, it was a job. A job I got paid to do, that's all. Chill did a hit for the Slocum bitch. For her people, they were afraid he'd turn yellow and rat. And we go back to a nice little close-up, more of a down angle of Batman. And he says, the target, Horton. Who did Chill murder? And we get a close-up of Horton. Some nosy society bitch, Martha Wayne, I think her name was. She was getting in the way of Slocum's business. Hell, you got any idea how much money there is in kitty porn? You got a business like that. You got to protect it, understand? Chill pulled it off, then got scared, so I had to do him. And then off panel, Barbara Slocum too? That wasn't a suicide, was it? And next we get a nice view of this poor woman's face. She's like, what's going on? Yeah, had to do it. The top guy said it was her or me. The top guy? Her uncle. Or anyway, that's what she called him. Milady, his <laughs> his name was. He split a long time ago. Took off for, what, Asia or somewhere? You knew what you were doing, Horton. You knew these people were raping children and taking pictures of it to sell? Yeah, that poor woman looks like she's getting mugged by word balloons from a Mort Drucker Mad Magazine movie parody. <laughs> <laughs> on this next page, we have seven panels, four on top, three on the bottom. As smug guys are to do, the uh, Horton lights a small stogie, and he muses, Yeah, I mean, hey... I wouldn't do anything like that myself. Far as I'm concerned, those clowns are a bunch of perverts. Even if I did, it's off the record. <laughs> <laughs> and, in a fa- and with his back to us, he, but I, I'm imagining he's sneering at Batman, and he continues, that it? You want to know anything else? Batman backpedals to the door, and he says no. Then he vanishes into the night. 
In the final three panels continue, Horton talks to the girl. In a unflattering language, he says, Hey, you stupid bitch. You're a whore or something? Don't just stand there. Get me a drink. Then in the telling move, you never turn your back. Never turn your back, but yet he does. And we see the cigar uh, smoke filtering the room. And he gets a little cocky and confident, and he says, What a chump. Best deal I ever made. When the Batman says something's off the record, that's it. Before he even starts tracking down all that stuff, I told him, I'll be on the beach in Rio. Hey, Rhonda, what are you doing? Where the hell did you go? Then we see that he turns, and now he's facing a gun. Dun, dun, dun. And Rhonda says, I'm right here, Alex. You're the one that's going to be concluded. It's it's, it's a pun, because yeah. the to be concluded... I like that you're the one who's the... going to be concluded. I thought yes. that was kind of funny. And he, <laughs> yes. Forgot, yes. he forgot the uh, most important thing, besides not starting a land, a land war in China is never turn your back on Batman in a book where where the writer um, really doesn't wrap his brain around the fact that Batman not only doesn't kill, but doesn't wander away while prostitutes have guns handy to kill someone. Uh, and <laughs> yes. I think in the book, he kind of encouraged her with a wink-wink, nod-nod. Batman doesn't kill people. He gets other people to kill people. Well, Batman, <laughs> he would not do that. Well, no, I, I liked on, on uh, Lane's... Uh, episode where she did the really, really good interview for him over on on her other podcast, and if anybody listening has not heard that, you should really go back to. I did while I was jogging one day, and when he <laughs> said that, yeah. basically, um, Vox points out that he's got about as much. Um, he agrees with the idea of Batman um, not killing about as much as Zack Snyder does. He, he yeah. doesn't quite get it. And I, I get that. He's a crime fiction writer. He doesn't understand that the idea of a person not killing in this circumstance is foreign to him. Exactly. Uh, well, this concludes the first part of our meeting. Uh, it looks like we lost Cat again. But, yeah, I, I had a feeling this this one might go into a 2 pata. They aren't terribly thick volumes, but I knew once we got all five of us together, there were going to be tangents aplenty. It's kind of, I mean, it's 47 pages, and in some of the panels, there's a lot of writing. True, yeah. There's a lot yeah. of information to get through. Yeah, and it's pretty heavy content, too, so I think there has to be a little decompression uh, with our uh, banter. No. There is something about it where... I mean, it's it's a comic book, and it's a Batman comic book, and he deals, you know, in, in dark stories, but there's something about this where you're kind of adding that, you know, that realism that, that's added intentionally, and it, j- just getting those kinds of words and images in your head mm-hmm. about, you know, child porn and uh, raping kids, and I'm, yeah. I'm going to need to watch Charlie Brown Christmas after this before I go yeah. to bed. <laughs> I'm going to go so far to say that it's, it's, I, I was not able to finish the book. After I got to exactly this point. Yeah, for a reason. I don't know how much you want me to rant about it or how much you guys agree or don't. But there's one thing. Uh, I have as much of a visceral issue with this. Now, mind you, I should should preface that by saying it's very good. What Andrew Vack is is doing in his books and all of this is good to get Mm -hmm. um, anything that gets awareness to this problem out there is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is why he uh, he was kind enough to come on my podcast and let a nobody like me interview him when he's done interviews left and right. He, he recognized it as a medium he hadn't used before, so he is all about getting awareness out there. So, yes, I'm sorry, go ahead, continue. <laughs> no, no, and, and mind you, again, everyone go listen to that. It was a great interview. No, oh, thank you. But that said, I know what he was attempting to do, and then Look, there's two things. This is Vax. I'm doing that was an attempt to get um, the message out mm-hmm. on this. This is an obvious cash grab. Right. This is an attempt to ad- adapt that to get people who had bought that to buy this. I have the same issue with this that I have with the movie Joker. J- just the concept of the movie Joker, not not the movie itself. That's a different thing. I don't like the idea of. M- taking something that requires the level of seriousness seriousness to talk about crime and child abuse mixed in with my comic books. I think it does a disservice to both of them. This Mm -hmm. Batman, because Batman is not a real person. I know that I'm no shock to all this, but (laughs) Batman is not a real person. You take that back. (laughs) <laughs> what does it do to the I don't think Batman's character is served very well here. I don't think Batman ranting yeah. about the fact that I'm fighting criminals, I'm not fighting crime. I I 
I, I get it. I get the point. The, showing about the impotence of that and all mm-hmm. of that and the powerlessness. Yeah. But Batman doesn't exist in a world where real mental illness happens or real systemic problems are going to be dealing with this. Sure. Batman lives in a world where people fall into vats of acid and turn into killer clowns. Right. Yeah. And it definitely comes across as like a PSA. And I and Batman that's not his purpose. I don't mm-hmm. real and anytime you try to do that, you got to do it really carefully and I don't think that either the novel or this comic quite get it. Mind you, I'm going to read part two. Yeah. The uh, revelation of his mother's past. That is such a huge moment that if that would turn, if this were canon, it would turn everything onto its ear. Oh my God. Can you imagine <laughs> the internet on that one? <laughs> <laughs> So I'm glad that this is such a, a an isolated, cocooned Entity without it bleeding over into other storylines. What did Chris? What did you think of that? You you being the yeah. the big Batman guy. Did. Uh, you know, it, it, it was a standalone, and I'm trying to frame it with respect to um, things that have come along in the past. With respect to okay, how was this packaged? You know, I think you know we got so many different events when they initially came out with the dark Knight trade format this was like oh this is a prestige book the only that we're going to put the top quality here and stuff like that but then when we got to stuff like uh things being churned out left and right things being elseworld stories things being like this the ultimate evil and things like uh the horrific miniseries called uh, batman run riddler run and i thought okay we've we've kind of reached an eight here with this and with this in the respective format <sighs> You know, John, I see your point, but you know, I, I just wonder if, if not, uh, this respective, like with the cash grab, I'm, I'm wondering if they tried to expose this fiction to a different audience. And I can certainly see your point that you know, you know, why, why do both and one, one versus the other. And I think I'm, I was trying to think, you know, with respect to you know putting a story out there, at least trying to raise some consciousness level with respect to how serious and the gravity of the problem itself is. Uh, it it possibly didn't translate well, and and I feel that's kind of sad because I think sometimes comics can do well with respect to addressing uh, real issues in, in this medium, but uh, perhaps did not translate well here. You know, I'm, I'm trying to think of the other ones like you know the uh, Teen Titans drug uh, issues that were put out in the 80s, and then the uh, looking at the world hunger problem uh, that DC did with uh, Heroes for Hunger and things like that, this doesn't quite uh, land. Yeah, with respect to uh, the issue at hand, and I, I think you raised some uh, good good Are points. Are they perhaps doing too much? Trying to do too much, like not only having him follow child pornography ring, but also the big revelation of his mother. Would it have done better if they had left that bit about his mother out of it and concentrated more on? The, the, his task at hand? I think probably so. Because it, it seems rather superfluous to have his mom be a secret crime fighter all this time. I don't... Mm-hmm. He doesn't need that as a motivator. He has all the motivation he needs. Right. Right. I think we talked when we talked about this before, I was okay with this version of Batman having that as a motivator. <laughs> Later I thought about that and changed my mind a little bit. I just don't think Batman's the right character for this sort of thing. He's too close to the act to this actual sort of thing in what he does in his comics. And, so mm-hmm. that leads to a level of, of discomfort. I think Superman would have been the guy you want. No, for this. I, I oh, think really? it's one of my biggest problems with this is that Batman's treated a bit like an idiot. Like, that, he, like yes. he's never heard of child abuse before in his life. Now he is a, a rich boy, but he's also Batman. Right. So you mm-hmm. think he's probably encountered this before. I would say that you'd need someone involved in this storyline who is much more removed from, like, the nitty-gritty criminal underbelly of the city. I was almost thinking, like, Oliver Queen. But the thing is, is that all the superheroes deal with that part of the city because that's their job. I think with Queen, you'd have the same problem. That's why I was saying Superman, and but not to monopolize this, because Superman is that would you you'd get the much better metaphor of I have all of these powers and this is happening and, he and there's deals nothing with more I can like do. Off planet kind of and issues so, and, and big 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 and threats. I, and, and I bring think you down really to... could have 
So to bring them down to like street level, you mean, is what would yeah. make that more impactful? Because yes. I think you might be right about that. And I think you really could have had a much better scene with Superman standing there with someone that he had just seen doing that stuff. And rather, you know, in this one, you had Bat, you know, Bruce grab the pressure point and lead him out. But to have Superman standing there going, I can't punch this guy, and impl- in- yeah. imply that he really wants to punch this guy. Yeah, Superman might have been a better choice of vehicle for this, this story. Yeah. Well, I mean, it makes sense why they would go with Batman, because mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. definitely it, it, his bailiwick. This is totally a Batman thing, which is also why it seems odd that he's like, tell me about this child abuse thing. Yeah, you know who kind of like stuck out to me as someone who might be, like we had mentioned Daredevil before, who would be a good one, but about the like treating Batman like an idiot, like he's never heard of child abuse before, the, the one that kind of popped up that might be a good vehicle for this might have been Spider-Man. Because he's so young, he's so almost naive in a way. He knows that things exist, but he it, he kind of just doesn't want to um, really touch on that. But if he is forced into that, you know, how how do you think Spider Man might handle? Would he have been better than and Batman? Or? Yeah, because especially to go from Spider Man mm-hmm. stories, which I mean, okay, I'm not terribly familiar with Spider Man stories. They get a little sad, but his villains are kind of. It's it's that Marvel not I don't want to say goofiness but there's just always a slightly more lighthearted aspect usually in it for the money money. yeah and this time though in the nineties you would have been like before the clone shit started anyway there would have been several uh, clone what oh my god if you we're not. (laughs) <laughs> oh, okay. Never. Then I don't know. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, we have the only person who doesn't know what I mean. What we mean when we say the phrase "clone saga," and let's just keep her innocent. But no, trust me, it's terrible. Um, okay. Uh, Spider Man. There. I. Like, I don't think he'd work either, and I think it's just a tone problem with him. You would have to go out of your way to change it to. See again that that begs the question of whether or not an established character like this in a universe where superheroes exist is the right vehicle to talk about this problem because it kind of trivializes it. Cat, on the other hand, okay. is looking- I think if approached correctly, almost any superhero could tackle this. But it has to be approached correctly, and especially superhero to superhero, right? If they didn't portray Bruce as such, like, a dum-dum, like, oh, I don't know what this is. Let me go talk to this social worker and figure out what child abuse is. I think they could have really pulled it off, but like it was said, you know, they, they are portraying him as not very intelligent. I think, genuinely, they could have done it better if he was presented as, hey, I know this is a problem, but I want to learn more about it. Not, yeah. I don't know what this is. Show me. I agree. And, like, with like as Lane said, with Spider-Man, I could see it happening as, you know, it could be introduced very organically. You know, he's, he's going about doing whatever Spideys do, and he happens to see something happen in an alleyway one day, and then that sparks a whole... Holy crap, that's a thing. That's a thing that happens. Yeah. He would need therapy afterward. Oh, yeah, poor Spidey. Ben Urich, frankly, would be a way to do that, to involve the Daily Oh, Daily yeah. Daily. But I do like the idea of, you know, like, 16-year-old Spider-Man encountering oh, oh. this and having to... Because when you're 16, like, y- even if you're Peter Parker, you're not going to give too much thought. You know, you're kind of wrapped up in your own world. Mm-hmm. And I think a, a young Spider-Man having to maneuver his way through a... a some sort of child abuse kind of a story would be kind of, in, I think that would be interesting. I think I, you could do it with him just fine. I personally can't think of any way that that wouldn't be ruined by anyone who would touch that issue. Well, and that's that's, that's part of it, too, is like, you know, how much of this just comes down to the writing mm-hmm. and the subject matter. Before someone, you're, 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 you're inevitably going to get a listener of this podcast who's going to uh, think of something, and I'll, I'll just put that out there to say we did not ignore it. Uh, back in the 70s, there was a Edu- quote unquote educational comic with Spider Man, and it was called Spider Man versus the Prodigy. It was sort of like a uh, giveaway. It was like a mini comic. It's a little tough to find, but I think you can find the story reprinted online. It does not translate well with with what, what you know trying to incorporate with the setting. Nor does it uh, attack a topic uh, as as serious as this. Basically, the story was about Spider Man examining uh, an issue with like uh, unprotected sex uh, and teen pregnancy. 
and that's sort of what where they kind of at least dip their toe in the water with with uh, looking at a pretty uh, socially conscious issue with the seventies and how they went at, at, in looking at that. And you know, we we did see a younger bit, bit Peter Parker there too. And I'm trying to really remember the details of it, but it's it's been so long, so I'm kind of foggy on it. But I'm sure some somebody out there listening would think, well, you know, Spider Man did you know at least do something with respect to trying to tackle a social issue at that point you know and they marvel you know kind of was trying to get on board with a little bit more relevancy i think more so than dc did at first you know with the uh, spider-man drug issues uh that stanley took off the code you know around the early 70s dc followed suit with the green lantern green arrow stories attacking the drug issue but uh I I'd really wanted to see him do a little bit deeper dive with this examining a socially conscious issue, you know, and the only other one I can think of more recently is like, uh, fast forward around this time was like, I think, uh, wasn't like there were like a, uh, an issue where they looked at, uh, landmines. They had like the DC heroes looking like all these landmines that were uh, buried in like, all these, uh, war torn countries and stuff like that. Oh, that, that reminded me of something. No, finish what you were saying there. I'm sorry. No, I was trying to think where, where else have we seen the comics where we had the, one of the, the big two is trying to tackle the, the quote social issues of the day, you know, and, and how, where did it land and where didn't it land? Spider-Man's done it um, around this time, actually. They dealt with uh, uh, Mary Jane had a younger sister named Christy who was bulimic. And and unfortunately, that ha- that uh, wound up going about as well as you'd think. Mm-hmm. It, it is the problem of something like this. You see, that it's usually because the people involved that are doing it it's either they know too much about it and want to feed you every aspect right. of it like mm-hmm. Max is doing here mm-hmm. or they want to dance around it like Stanley did in the uh, in the issue in the drugs issue you're talking about where the problem was drugs yeah and the drugs that you take make you like he wasn't doing any particular drug that matched any sort of drug that was available in the in the 70s he was doing pills and it made him crazy and did all sorts of weird things um, yeah. Speedy and Green Lantern at least was, you know, shooting heroin, even though it was... Oh, that's... Yeah. Even though he was doing it for effect so we could have the most famous, you know, cover of all time or whatever. With the dead Speedy? No, it was like, my ward is a junkie! (laughs) (laughs) Well, on that note... I think we can wrap up here so we can get signed off the night and get up early in the morning. But thank you all so much for joining me for part one, and we will kind of touch base and see when we can get together to do the second part. So you before we go oh. totally, I'm really sorry, Maggie. Keep I can fear her staring daggers every time. Is I, I think, but than but I Chris, um, Pat, I, Pat Sampson is is chopping at the bit with the fact that here I am actually on a show <laughs> with you, and I didn't <laughs> oh, didn't great. say you know you who is known as the the the, um, the Batman to Oracle or BTO as it were that one should let it roll. <laughs> thank you thank you so much john i appreciate the appreciate the plug every the first time i was on there and i followed suit since uh when i did transformers chronicles which i do over on the long Box crusade with pat and delvin yes we can skip this part with me <laughs> pat and delvin hi delvin john's bothering me uh they start. I listen. I when I started doing the show with them, I had listened to a couple of their stuff, but was not a you know deep seated in. And uh, to be completely honest with everyone, I always skipped over the parts with the likes and shares. You know when I was listening to it. So when they started doing that, when the first time with you, I had absolutely no idea what was going on, and I didn't quite realize that they were doing "Let It Roll Down the Highway." And so when they paused with me ready to do something, it was just quiet. <laughs> Chirp, 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 chirp. <laughs> but oh no, John! Oh no! I'm sure they that you you got hipped up and everything and everything was cool and everything yeah. is true. And plus, since then, you know, if you thought that was bad, you ain't seen nothing yet. Ah, very good. See, I saw what you did there. Well, we will uh, reconvene at our next meeting and finish up this this story. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Wayne. Okay, nice to meet you, John. Nice to meet you. Talking to you. We'll have to go. Until next time.